be in order. If you have a sign, you can sit with it. We're, we're limited on space, and you need to be on that side of the council chamber, please. Otherwise, we do not allow signs just generally in the council chambers because they can block our view or, our, or of the, the television and they're quite frankly distracting. So, all right, um, call the meeting to order. Uh, Mr. Davis, could you do a pledge for us? Gerald, could you do the invocation, please? Let us pray. Lord, we give you thanks this evening as we can come together as a community, find solutions, find answers in a conciliatory manner that will be for the good of the parish that we love. Bless us in this new year. Thank you for getting us to this new year. We have much to be thankful for. Let us work together for the benefit of all our citizens. Amen. Amen. Madam Clerk, you call the roll, please. Mr. Dean? Here. Mr. Fitzgerald? Here. Ms. Casabon? Here. Mr. Lorino? Here. Mr. Taladano? Yes. Ms. Tanner? Here. Mr. Davis? Here. Mr. Canulet? Here. Mr. Mike Smith? Here. Ms. O'Brien? Here. Mr. Lachlan? Here. Mr. Bender? Here. And Mr. Airy? Here. We have a quorum. Thank you. Okay, <clears throat> public comment. A three minute time limit is established for each member of the public willing to speak for or against an item on the agenda. Accept appeals. Note the on the agenda. If it's not on the agenda and you try to speak about it, Deputy Broussard is going to show you outside. Uh, to ensure that all speakers are heard, please hold cheers and applause. Anyone who wishes to, ensure, to place a comment on the record but does not wish to speak at the podium may fill out a speaker card and check the box indicating that they do not wish to speak. Okay. Um, uh, before we start, um, being that this is a, a, a new chairman, um, uh, Councilman Bender, if you could come up. Jerry was our chair for 2022, and as his vice chair, I can tell you that he put in a tremendous amount of time over and above um, what's normally required of, of a council member, or certainly a council chair, and we really appreciate all your hard work, Jerry. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you. I'm not going to let you speak, so don't worry about it. All right, we have um, on the ordinance for introduction, we have multiple items that need to be pulled. Um, number one uh, and number three, an ordinance for amending the code. We're we gonna do those first. Let me, okay. I'm sorry, jumped the gun there a little bit. Uh, first, we'll go to the presentation, the proclamation to St. Tammany Parish Government Employees of the Month. President Cooper, please. Thank you and good evening, ladies and gentlemen, members of the council, members of the public that is here with us tonight. Uh, we're certainly glad to have you on this first meeting of the new year of the St. Tammany Parish Council. Uh, I'd like to take a moment of pers personal privilege to first congratulate Councilman Airy in your uh, election to serve as chair of the Parish Council and to Council Member Cheryl Tanner, who will serve as Vice Chair. Congratulations on uh, your appointments. That deserves an applause. And of course, I do want to wish a Happy New Year to, to you, to our citizens uh, of St. Tammany. We're looking forward to a safe, healthy, and prosperous 2023. Uh, tomorrow, January 6th, is King's Day, and 
with that comes the traditional proclamation of the, the start of the carnival season in St. Tammany. And I wish all captains, riders, marching groups, and crews a safe and successful Mardi Gras season here in St. Tammany. And finally, before I call Ms. Latif up to the podium, I'd like to thank my executive staff and all of our department directors for their presence here tonight as they do every meeting um, and as they work uh, throughout the year to serve our citizens. So thank you all for being here. Uh, I have the privilege every month to issue a proclamation and acknowledge one of our employees for their outstanding service. And this evening, I have the honor of honoring Latif El Amin. And Latif, would you come up here, please? As I read this proclamation, whereas Latif El Amin began her career with St. Tammany Parish government in 2007 with the Planning and Development Department before transferring to the Public Works Department as the park manager for the Trace, and whereas Latif started her new position in July of 2022 and was immediately tasked not only with learning the nuances of a new department, but also the responsibility of managing one of our most cherished assets, the 31 mile Tammany Trace. Whereas Latif embraced her new role and in August of last year, began spearheading the multi-departmental undertaking of the Holiday of Lights event on Coop Drive working closely with the Tammany Trace Foundation to restore the event to its previous magnitude. And whereas after many meetings, sleepless nights, and logistical curveballs, the event attracted nearly 20,000 visitors to Coop Drive to enjoy the lights, decorations, performances, and children's activities over the course of the first two weekends in December. And whereas Latif approached the Holiday of Lights undertaking with a positive attitude and never lost her cool or her sense of humor while effectively communicating her expectations for the event and reestablishing Holiday of Lights as a seasonal staple for St. Tammany Parish. Now there for I, Michael B. Cooper, as parish president of this great parish, do hereby recognize the dedication, work ethic, and accomplishments of Latif El Amin as employee of the month January 2023, and encourage you and our citizens of St. Tammany Parish to thank her for her contributions and commitment to St. Tammany Parish. Congratulations, Latif. And now the official photo. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Would you like to say a few words, Latif? No. Okay. <laughs> On behalf of Latif, she's, she's honored, and she did a great job with a great team, with a great team for the Holiday of Lights. And if you missed it, you really missed, you really missed it. So thank you. Thank you. We'll move to appointments. Uh, resolution to appoint Frederick Young Jr. to replace Kyla Gilchrist. Term expired on the Board of Commissioners for Recreational District Number 11. Is that Mr. Fitzgerald? Mr. Toledano. So, so moved. So moved. Second by Ms. Cas Second by Mr. Toledano. Uh, please vote. The motion is unanimous with no one absent. Okay. Moving to um, ordinances uh, from on the consent calendar need to be pulled. Um, ordinances. Oh, okay, got to read this. Any items not pulled from the consent calendar are automatically approved and hold by one vote. Items pulled from the consent calendar are discussed and voted upon individually. The majority vote of the entire council, eight, is required to adopt the consent calendar. And so we have a number of items uh, already marked to be pulled. Ordinance amending the code number one, number three, finance ordinance number four, moratorium ordinance number eight and number nine, 
uh, postpone resolution number one, bond council resolutions number six and seven. I think that is all. Um, does the administration have any? Do you have any? Which six? six? Ordinance or resolution? One seven seven number six, amendment um, two to the operating budget. All right. Must have missed that one. Mm -hmm. right. um, Mr. Dean, do you have anything to pull? Mr. Fitzgerald, Mr. Casbon, Mr. Lorino, Mr. Toledano, anything else? Oh. We've already pulled those. Mr. Davis? Me? No. Um, Stanner? No. No, Mr. sir. Mr. Candulet? Mr. Smith? No, sir. Ms. Um, O'Brien? No, sir. Mr. Arthur? No, sir. Um, Mr. Bender? No. Okay. Anyone from the audience? No. Okay. All right, we'll move to. Um, Do I need a consent calendar vote? Oh, okay. So anything that we didn't pull, I'd like to have a, a motion to um, introduce that. Uh, moved by Mr. Davis, seconded by Mr. Taladano. All in favor, please vote. The motion is unanimous with no one absent. All right. Um, moving to uh, ordinance number one. Um, this was a, an ordinance that came about um, when we... Uh, put the budget forward and we put pay raises in for the rank and file employees, we made it clear that we did not want to um, increase the parish council salary. So in order to make sure that that uh, happened, uh, there was an ordinance that had some language in it that seemed to indicate that could fluctuate based on a CFO certification. So we're simply taking that out and we're just clarifying that the amount that we've uh, had as a salary for the past four or five years, that's going to be the amount going forward in the budget. So there is no increase in the salary. Um, I'd like to make a substitute amendment okay. that verifies that. Okay. We have a, a motion to uh, substitute, um, just to, to, to clarify that language based on, second by Mr. Canulet. I'd like to vote on the subject. Or, do you want to talk now or do you want to talk? Yes. Okay. Uh, so, Mr. Chairman, the only thing I would ask for, and I, I do realize, uh, I read your email and, and things have been very, very busy, so I completely understand. Uh, however, having read, uh, having been involved in the original change that went into effect back in 2016, which did not increase council members' salaries, okay, uh, I, I would hope that perhaps you would reach out to a few of us between now and the next meeting to discuss the changes I'm reading that I don't fully understand on the introduction and the substitute. Just, just a request that we have some conversation so we're clear on what we're voting on in the next month. Thank you. Sure thing. I think uh, we have one card, Ms. Stevens. Good evening. Terry Lewis Stevens, 725 Dove Park Road. I have a couple of concerns about the particular striking of that uh, language because the council, that portion of the council falls under the Home Rule Charter and the Home Rule Charter cannot be amended, appealed, or adopted without a vote of the people. So you can't strike through something that's in that section of the code unless you take it to the people. And the other part that really concerned me before I even found this out this afternoon is the fact that in the state constitution, it's also supported in section 65.5c. Look in that portion and you'll see also that you cannot change the home rule charter by a motion of this board without it going before the people. Um, the fact that you're striking that particular passage is, is troubling because what it does when I looked at it five or six times was instead of the council being regulated 
to follow the same percentage that's the, of increase that's given to the rest of the parish employees, now there's no limit on there. So why would that not enable you to then raise your salary, which is not in the charter, which is in the code of ordinances, to whatever you feel like you wanted it to be? I mean, um, some of you are business members, or business owners, rather, and how would it be if you went to your employees and said, I'm not going to give you a COLA raise, I'm going to let you decide how much raise you'd like? And who would not say, double it, triple it? So if you have no specified limit, which is what you're doing now, is striking the formula by which you have a limit, then you've left it open-ended. But let's go back to the beginning. You need to, to change the charter. You need to put it before the voters and let them decide. Thank you. Right, uh, so that's been moved. Okay. Uh, yeah, so motion in a second. Who is the second? Uh, Can you let? Thank you. Would you want me to address the charter issue? Yeah, why don't you just address it? I mean, that's. Uh, just uh, to clarify some of the p comments that have been made from the public, I just wanted to point out uh, to Ms. Stevens and to the council themselves that Section 205 of the Home Rule Charter does allow the council by ordinance to amend the salary of the council members, provided that no increase happens in the last year of the term, and provided that no further change becomes effective until the current term of the council members adopting the ordinance. So. It does allow that our home rule charter does allow the salaries of council members to be changed by ordinance. And, and I would just point out that this is actually doing away with an automatic increase that comes up. So that's that's where we are on it. But that's um, can we vote now? Can we clarify that though? Because what what Ms. Cuvian just said was a different passage in the code. What I referred to is 2.71, which is the language you're trying to strike, and that's, that's what I'm an, saying that's that an, I have an objection that's an to. That's an ordinance. That's an ordinance. That's not the code that you're that, that we're amending. It's in the charter section of Muni Code. No, ma'am, that's in the code of ordinances. The salary aspect is, but the first part is in Muni Code. It's in Muni Code under the Home Rule Charter. Um, can we please vote on the substitution? The motion passes with 12 yeas and one nay. Uh, number three, uh, Mr. Lorino. Uh, Mr. Bender, I mean, uh, Mr. Eric, could I, uh, we just discussed uh, the council uh, salary, oh. and I'd like to uh, read something uh, which is relevant to that you know it's not like we're putting something on the agenda that hasn't been discussed and uh, we just discussed it and part of it kind of goes to a little bit with miss what miss steven says i don't have you have me you on you said so this is timely to do that okay okay you have my you have it on okay thank you thank you anyway uh you know after looking at this and seeing it come coming on the agenda uh, there, there was a time that I was uh, thinking about uh, going in a different direction, and one of one of the ideas that I had as a, a platform, and this is relative to that, and I just like to read it for this council, future council, to consider as we going forward, because as I look out here, I see a lot of people teaching school, doing things that really donate a lot of time and effort. And I'm fortunate enough to be retired. And I know how much time I spend in District 4 and when I was chairman for a few years. And it takes a little time. And uh, I enjoy every minute of it. But I know how hard it must be for people to come from, as my friend there, Mr. Fitzgerald, who comes from the school directly here. and serve the people of St. Tammany Parish. So as, as St. Tammany Parish has grown and become the fourth largest parish in the state, I think St. Tammany Parish needs to also start to grow and do a few things that warrant the fourth largest parish in the state. 
And so I, I just like to read this, Mr. Airy, and uh, I'm not asking for any discussion. I just want to put it on the record for future discussion. As St. Tammany Parish continues to grow and develop, it seems important that parish government remains open to change and to ensure we can best meet the needs of the citizens we are elected to represent. I think we should examine the structure and commitment of the council and terms, and then, uh, and then allow our citizens to vote. Sort of what Ms. Stevens said a minute ago, allow our citizens to vote. More specifically, we should discuss reducing the number of council districts, establishing council seats as full-time employees, and instituting possibly two at-large council members. If St. Tammany residents did vote to make these changes, our parish would be involving in the direction that many of the other large and more densely populated parishes in Louisiana have already grown. Under our current structure, the parish government, council rather, is a second job for most of us. We can all agree that meeting the demands of full-time employment and needs of our family does not leave much time for anything else. Committing to a part-time council position in a parish as populous as, and dynamic as St. Tammany likely deters potential candidates that may want to make an impact contribution to the parish. It seems appropriate to consider these changes now as many of our council members are only eligible to serve two more terms after this year and make sense to plan for the structural change while we still have their knowledge and ex expertise on the council for at least this many years. So I just wanted to put that out, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you. Thank you, Councilman Marino. And if you want me to go to my... Um, I don't know. Did you want to talk? Real quick, yeah, yeah. I, I, I want to say this. I don't like to agree with Mr. Lorino, uh, but I am so glad to see he's on the boat that I've been pushing for the last couple of years. This parish deserves full time. It's, it's, it's crazy to say we're part-time employees because it takes a lot of our time. So I agree with Mr. Lorino. It's, it's a right step. It'll make St. Tammany stronger in the long run and it is really the way to go. But we have to do it right. Like he says, we have to have a charter amendment change and things like that. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Thank you, uh, Councilman Taylor. To I need to, inter to introduce the substitute uh, motion. Yes. Uh, Mr. Candelat, will you second that? Yes, sir. All right, we just need a motion and a second. All right. Um, <clears throat> number three, uh, Mr. Lorena. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you. Uh, I'd like to pull this uh, until uh, next month's meeting, uh, until we clarify a little legal language. Uh, so I'm going to ask the council to uh, postpone till next month. A motion to postpone. Do yes, you have sir. a second? Uh, Councilman Fitzgerald. Number three. Uh, please vote the, to postpone for one month, Mr. Lorino. The motion is unanimous with no one absent. Uh, we have number four, ordinance counter number 7175, ordinance to amend the 2023 capital improvement budget and capital assets. Amendment number one, parish wide roads and drainage. Tammany Trace and parish wise drainage. Uh, Mr. Taladano. Mr. Eric, thank you very much. And, and I'm going to speak, if you will, to ordinance uh, number 7175 and 7177 so it's not to be repetitive. Uh, and, and, and I'm going to. Uh, make these comments uh, prior to asking you to entertain my motion. I, I heard Mr. Fitzgerald just a moment ago in his prayer say, in a conciliatory fashion. And I think those words were uh, very appropriate as we talk about where we are today. It, it is obvious to me, and I think to all of us, that we're not on the same page when it comes to some fiscal uh, decisions and sometimes policy 
uh, but importantly, actions, a lot of which, and the vast majority of which, serve our constituents very well. Uh, I, I believe that we can learn a lesson from this exercise because I, for one, being involved in some of this as to some major capital projects that uh, in affect my, my district, uh, have gotten a lot of thoughts sh shared with me and for me with regard to these policies, decisions, appropriations. And here's what I believe. I believe at the end of the day, we're not doing our best work in communicating. And that cuts in both ways. I, 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 uh, I assign responsibility in my own mind for all of us. And I think that the exercise that we learn here today is that as we go forward in 2023, if we do a better job of communicating amongst ourselves, we won't be in these type of situations. There's a lot of what I call great stuff to use a non-accounting uh, term in these ordinances, but there's stuff that just needs to be talked about and vetted more. And so I, I think as opposed to going forward in, in a way where people aren't all on the same page, my thinking is, how do I get this to be a fresh start? A, a, a time where we sit down and everybody's on the same page. I, and, and these are just by way of examples. I hear, I hear some commentary about some of these capital projects. I, I just happened to talk to our engineer about one, so that's the only reason why I mentioned that. Uh, the bridges, S seemingly a necessary project. I've spent a lot of time with Mr. Hill talking about that. But some people, in, in fairness to them, are not sure and not certain and don't feel 100% that that's ready to go. So it, it creates a, a disconnect that I think the, the lesson here is that we do a better job of communicating on these things. And I think the same would apply whether we're talking about the bypass. Look, one of these uh, things in these budget amendments that I'm speaking to involves a comprehensive drainage study, I think a $300,000 allocation. Well, I bet you if I asked everybody in the audience uh, if they think that we need a careful look at drainage, I think they'd probably raise both of their hands. Uh, so the good news, having said that to the people here, that, that I'm confident all this good stuff is going to get done. But I don't think it's ripe today, and therefore I don't think it's fair to all parties considered. Number one, the public. And then the number two and 2A, we're all the same, the council and the administration. So in the spirit of getting it started right in 2023, and in the spirit of hoping and fully expecting and confident that uh, our leadership will be communicating with the administration to work out some of this stuff and have a good understanding Again, only by way of example, the justification for the bridges. Only by way of example. Please understand that, that I'm not here talking about bridges. I use that as an example. So with that in mind, um, uh, President um, Ari, it is my intention, and I'm going to move to pull at this time, ordinance is number 7175 and 7177, saying again, that is not an opinion as to the good or bad about these ordinances, 
But I think if we start off right now and say, you know what, we're gonna we're gonna t we're gonna communicate m more, better. Not that's two separate words, so I don't want to slaughter the English language. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna we're gonna get here with the this everybody having the same knowledge about the same stuff, so that we don't argue about it. And the danger of arguing about it is that good projects, which there's a whole bunch in this stuff, good, good stuff doesn't get uh, lost and doesn't get thrown aside. And, and the opportunities to do those things, to do good works, do not um, uh, go awry. Well, thank you. So, if, so you, you're just going. To, you're just not moving forward with it at this point. That's so my correct. understanding from legal is, and, since and, you're the sponsor, then that's that's it. It, it, it yeah, dies and, right and, now. Yeah, and I'm, and we can put aside the issue of how this sponsorship rose because that's not material, but it was honest uh, misunderstanding. <laughs> but that being said, uh, do you need separate motions on these? No, I mean, you can make either a motion to remove it from the agenda or you can just not introduce it and it won't move forward. Well, a motion to remove from the agenda might be the appropriate motion. I'll second. All right. Get the vote. Discussion? I'll second. I think President Cooper wanted me. President Cooper wanted We don't need that one. <clears throat> I think in light of all that, if you still want to discuss it, then I'm not, I'm not going to deny you the opportunity to. Okay. I would hope. For the, pur for the purposes of those who may be here on behalf of this, these two ordinances and for the public who have been following this, I think it's important to know that these two ordinances include are proposing to reintroduce this, the five major projects that were omitted from the 2023 budget when it was presented to the Parish Council in September uh, 28th of last year. And this, this was to re put these five projects back for discussion with the introduction of the ordinance tonight and hopefully, hopefully discussion next month for the adoption and to, to get the reasons and the justifications of why these projects are so important. The funding is available and the, and the importance of the projects. Uh, and again, uh, just to remind the public, remind that last month, at the end of the month, after the, uh, the Parish Council had a special meeting to override the veto of almost $11 million in projects that were added to the budget while taking out these impactful traffic and drainage projects. And that, of course, uh, those, the override was successful in, in allowing the almost $11 million of unidentified projects when we were heavily questioned about the, the magnitude of the projects that we had presented. Uh, we are communicating we're communicating the importance of these projects and giving you information each and every day, it seems, particularly on these five projects. It, it has become difficult, I believe, for understanding, and, and Councilman Toledano mentioned that, the understanding of the projects. Our parish engineer and the engineers in his department, our public works director and the engineers in his department are the ones who bring these projects to our attention so that we present it in our budget. Our finance department, all of our departments vet these projects to make sure that they are in a position to be funded and to be approved in our budget. And it seems that the, there are more questions about it now, uh, and there was some, some information, misinformation at the last meeting that uh, regarding our capital outlay request uh, that would make these projects uh, not considered for funding. And uh, we've asked our legislative liaison, Renee Roberts, to, to be here tonight to answer those questions that you had about are the projects, are the projects not, 
Yeah, but are, are the Cooper, projects still viable for funding at Capital Outlay if we fund these projects? The President Cooper, we, you know, we've had three or four meetings on this. There was a PowerPoint presentation on it. I don't think we need to rehash it anymore, especially considering that there's a motion to just remove it from the agenda. So there's really not an item on the agenda now to speak. I let you speak out of courtesy, but as, as I think Councilman Toledano said and we've talked, there are some legitimate questions on this, and we will um, move forward when, when those are answered. So I think uh, council will Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman. Like Thank you. Just one brief statement. Uh, when we looked at the council looked at this in the in uh, the finance committee, there's questions that we raised, and we are still getting answers to these. We have time to do that this year. It's not a question of if the money's available. It is a question of of when it's available. It's once we get the answers. The co projects are complete. We have cost estimates. That's when it will be before this council. I'd like to call for a question. Well, yes, I'd like to move. Excuse me. Uh, well, I have a, if you want, I'll do a motion to cut off debate. If that's what we want to do in second, we'll vote on that. Well, well if, if you will, just let me say what I was going to ask. I was going to ask the, the uh, chair to entertain Ms. Roberts' comments because she has come here and I think having briefly uh, previewed our comments, I think they're very relevant and I think they're educational to all of us. I think in due respect to her position as our legislative liaison, uh, liaison part of me, I would ask the chair to allow her to make a brief statement. I have a pending motion to call the question. Second. We have a second on that. So let's vote on that. If, if The motion passes with 12 yeas and one nay, and no one absent. Right. Then, uh, under Robert's rules, we need to vote on the motion to remove. Okay. Well, motion to remove on ordinance uh, calendar number 7175. The motion is unanimous with no one absent. And then we'll need a, another motion to remove uh, ordinance calendar number 7177. Um, Mike Smith's motion moved. Council to Town Tower on second. Um, all in favor, please vote. Mr. Lorena. The motion is unanimous with no one absent. All right. Um, moving on to uh, moratorium ordinances, we have um, order. Yeah. Uh, I thought I hit a request to speak. Again, uh, may I speak? Thank if you. you're going to speak on number eight, we haven't gotten to that one yet. We just already voted on those two. No, so. no, no. I was going to move uh, for point of personal privilege. <coughs> I believe that it No, is not right now, Mr. Toledano. We're, we're trying to move through this. Yeah. No, sir. No. I finish my question. No, you cannot finish your question. I've given you a significant amount of leave already to talk about this. That was going to be pulled from the agenda. Yeah. So let's go to more ordinance, moratorium ordinance number eight. Um, this is ordinance calendar number 7179, ordinance to extend for six months. The moratorium on the submissions of submissions to the planning Parish Planning Commission for the rezoning of multifamily property and our issuance of certain permits by the Parish Department of Planning and Development for the construction or placement of new multifamily building structures on property zone A6, A7, or A8 in Council District Number 12. Um, Councilman Binder, I think we need a, a justification for the extension. Yes. Yes, sir. Uh, so first of all, on at the next meeting where it would be up for adoption, I'll provide uh, written documentation and photographs to all council members and the public. Uh, basically, uh, my council district, I believe has, the, my concern is, is apartments. Uh, when I look at, at my council district, I'm not opposed to apartments because it's a useful way 
that some people have to be able to live. But I have thousands in my council district. I'm looking at which areas, as opposed to the whole district, uh, needs a moratorium uh, until I can look at improved uh, drainage in a particular area, uh, uh, perhaps some left turn lanes, which I, by the way, have put in through Ms. Campo earlier in the budget process, uh, funds for particularly for those reasons. So I'm backing up my concerns with some funding uh, to, to try to make it better to where I can remove the moratorium. Uh, I will provide more details with photographs and, and written documentation at our next meeting. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I just need a motion and a second on that one. Councilman Bender moves. Motion. For, and uh, seconded by Councilman Smith. Okay. Um, uh, ordinance number nine uh, on moratorium ordinances, calendar number 7180. Ordinance to extend the moratorium on receipt of submissions by the planning or parish zoning commission for rezoning a property which would result in an increase in the allowable density of a residentially zoned parcel greater than A4. It's a four, four units per acre, a planned unit development overlay PUD, or a traditional neighborhood development district TND parish wide. Um, I guess this would be Councilman Davis. Yeah. Thank you. I have to say I'm, I'm pretty pleased with the way the administration and the planning and zoning and the simple solutions are getting all together and trying to get uh, some some all this information for us to be able to, to determine exactly if and when we need to go ahead and get rid of this moratorium. At this time, I don't believe it's needed, and I'll tell you why. I believe we need to go ahead and extend this moratorium again for another three months. Obviously, we had the 2040 plan already done. That's nice. Uh, engineering is is getting through with some of this uh, 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 some some of these other criteria for drainage getting started, which obviously with the with the budget the thing that we're concerned about. And, and I have to bring this up, and I I don't mean to go back, but I have to because of this point. Let's talk about this about about information and stuff. And I talked about this last week about clarity. This is what confuses me the most. We did not omit or take out anything from the budget. That did not happen. All we did is basically postpone it until we get enough information to decide if this is what's best for everyone. That's, that's what's happening. We're not hurting the administration. We're actually trying to help them to communicate with us for our own public, for each district, and understand what's happening. Now, with this moratorium as well, I, I'm a firm believer in this. I think it's been, it's been doing very, very well on this. I think the administration is getting a lot, a lot of work done. Matter of fact, I'd like to call uh, uh, engineer uh, Daniel. Would you come up and speak a little bit about some of the progress that's been made on this moratorium and the status of it? And I appreciate the uh, emails that were being sent to all the councilmen about the status. And just tell us how you're doing with with all this information and all these different studies and such. All right. Um, I guess first, I'm not going to take all, all the credit for things. There well, are I some know. things that I are know, under utilities and uh, planning. Yeah. Right. So I, I go over yeah. uh, two hours. Um, yeah, we can get Ross up here too. I mean, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. I mean, I gonna, uh, <laughs> but I mean, I just so the, so the public knows exactly where we're headed with all this. Yes. So uh, I guess one of, one of them, and uh, I guess this is majority in uh, Councilman Toledano's district, was a sustainable growth pilot study um, that has wrap, wrapped up. Good. Um, so we're, what you, you, you developed a plan. It's to the part where it's going to start being, uh, how do we implement the things that were determined in this study? So we're going to be meeting as an administration to present something to council on how, how we implement the changes that that study called for. Um, we also have the parish comprehensive drainage plan. We've held two public meetings already. We have two upcoming at the last uh, week of January. It's really just a repeat. It's a public outreach event to make sure that the plan is going in the direction the general pu public would like the plan to go. Um, comprehensive is comprehensive. No stone unturned. That's the, the approach to this. Um, so it's moving forward and we hope to have the first phase re reporting done on that and available to the public 
Um, we're looking at, uh, I think it was the end of, end of April on the timeline. So we should, we're moving forward well on that. Good. Thank you very much. Yep. I appreciate it. Is Mr. Liner here today by any chance? Mr. Liner, again. I'm sorry I'm doing all this during introduction, but I think it's a good idea to get this out in the open. How's the UDC going? UDC is going well. Yes. Um, you know, that's something that needs to be updated. Going back to our comprehensive plan, you know, our previous plan was uh, adopted in 1999-2000. Should be updated every five years or so for a community like ours. Um, so this administration is very happy with the uh, New Directions 2040 plan. We're using it in staff reports for Planning and Zoning Commission. Uh, the public is accessing it as well and referring to it at those meetings. Um, <clears throat> we have a big win with our low impact development, uh, low impact development uh, green infrastructure guidebook. Uh, we use that information to create a section and ordinance for site and structure provisions and site design for AML zoning classifications that requires an engineering feasibility study on the use of low impact development and low, low impact development and green infrastructure on sites. So that's a big win as well. Um, UDC is moving forward. We hope to release that to the public first quarter of this year. And one more project that we had listed on there. The wetlands uh, policy guidebook as well. Now it's moving forward with mapping, ground truthing. So we hope to have that one first, second quarter of this year as well. Thank so, you. All good stuff. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Okay. And again, even during introduction and stuff like that, no, normally we don't expand on all this stuff, but I think it's best to get all that information out there. And because of that, and understanding where we are with all these different tasks that the administration is trying to do, I'd like to make a motion to extend the moratorium for another three months. Just to move it to introduce. To introduce. Move to introduce. Okay. Second by. Uh, yeah, that's what I meant. <coughs> Councilman Toledano, we don't need a vote since that's just an introduction. All righty. Moving on to postpone resolutions. Uh, number one, resolution CS number 6680, resolution to concur or not concur with the Town of Pearl River annexation and zoning of 12.2 and 3.0 acres more or less from Parish I-2 industrial and A-2 residential to Town of Pearl River R-3 multifamily residential for both parcels, properties located on Pump Slow Road and divided by I-59, total of 15.2 acres situated in Section 6, Township 8 South, Range 15 East, Ward 8, and District 9. Um, I believe this is Councilman Smith. Okay, we're uh, waiting on <clears throat> paperwork and communication from the city of Pearl River on this. We haven't heard anything from them. So we have contacted them. We, we're just on hold. Till so we get, till move we to get. postpone for one month? Yes, move to postpone. Seconded by Councilman Bender. Uh, all in favor, please vote. The motion is unanimous with no one absent. All right, we have uh, Bond Council Resolution Number 6, which is Resolution CS Number C-6711, a resolution approving the holding of election in Fire Protection District Number 7, Parish of St. Tammany, Louisiana, on Saturday, April 29, 2023, to authorize the levy of a special tax herein. Uh, we do have some cards on that, and as well yes, as and Bond, the Bond Council. Yes. Go ahead, Bond Council. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Jason Akers with Foley and Udell. Uh, privileged to be your bond council uh, chief is with me as well. I'll just give you a very brief uh, uh, legal explanation, and then uh, we're happy to answer any questions that you have. This uh, resolution merely authorizes the holding of an election in Fire District Number 7, um, which is in uh, Councilmember Tanner's district. Uh, I, I'll say primarily, it may be exclusively. Right. Primarily, okay, thank you. So I get a little fuzzy on the edges <laughs> sometimes. Uh, however, this is merely just the authorization to move forward. Um, the district will be responsible for calling the election, filing with State Mod Commission, and then uh, promulgating the results of the election, uh, regardless of which way it goes. Uh, your approval tonight merely authorizes that process to move forward. Um, and puts it before the people. So again, just happy to answer any questions that you have about it. Chief. Chief. Council, I'd like to um, address you and just give you a, a little bit of information about the millage and some facts about our fire district. Our fire district consists of 176 square miles, which is 21% of this parish. It is a rural area with around 6,500 to 7,000 residents. At current, our, our budget 
if you added all the fire protection for the entire parish, consists of about 1.46%. If you can't see the issue with that, those numbers are just solid. Um, we may have a small population, but we have a long distance to drive. Right now, we staff three of our five stations, which technically we probably need two more stations because of the populated area in Money Hill and then some areas that we're unable to cover. Of those three stations, we only staff one person at each station. So we put our employees at risk by having only one person at each station. And this is not because we want to do that, it's because we're trying to spread out the few people that we can afford to have to get to our residents sooner to help them in emergency situations. That first responder, first initial out, may take an average of about seven and a half minutes to get to someone. If you're in need of life-saving interventions on medical calls, which we go on every single call that is not law enforcement matters only, so anything that someone calls 911 for, we will respond. And so in order to provide those life-saving interventions or to uh, protect property from fire or any other hazard, our first responder is going to, the first initial response is going to be seven and a half minutes average due to the distance we have to drive. Um, we've been at around 20, in that 20 mil range for a number of years, for more years than I've been the chief, which is 10 years now. If you look at adjacent fire districts, they're in the range of 35 mils. One is at 42 as a maximum. So what we're doing here is not simply just asking for additional funding, we're asking to be on par with some of the other districts who have some of the same issues that we have. Um, because of our current funding, our, sta our fleet of trucks are near 20 years old and we have no plan to replace them because there is absolutely no funding available to replace them. We cannot place two firefighters at one station, much less staff according to NFPA, National Fire Protection Agency, of four persons per truck. We are just trying to provide a reasonable service to a rural population. And in order to do that, we need to have an additional millage. And the only way that we can, we can survive as a fire district, and which if this doesn't happen for us, at some point we may be back before this council to say, what's gonna to happen to the fire district? Just simply because we could potentially lose our, our rating, our PIL, PIAL rating, which affects everyone's property insurance rate and several other factors. So this is a crisis for our fire district. Thank and you. With that being said, I'll, I'll entertain any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. I think your chairman may want to speak. Do you, would you like to speak? Thank you, Mr. Chairman and fellow council members. Uh, Chris Nadish in 800 Camp Hill Drive. Um, I'm the chairman of the of Fire Protection District 7's board. I concur with what Chief Whitehead just explained to you, but also we're trying to plan ahead. Uh, as many of the discussions talk about infrastructure, roads, drainage, and so forth, we have the 60 Rayburn Highway coming right through the middle of our fire district, and we're trying to plan ahead. We're trying to, yes, pick up for, you know, make up for lost um, uh, uh, millages, if you will, and generate enough funding to get us on par with, the other, with our surrounding uh, fire districts, but we're also trying to prepare for the future. And we're also trying to protect the, the residents of Fire District Protection District 7, but we're also trying to protect our firemen. We have firemen that are arriving at, at, at a fire, and they cannot, technically are not supposed to go into that, into that house fire without backup. And as, Chairman, as, as the Chief uh, pointed out, our backup is a significant amount of time away from where that, that particular fire may be. So we're trying to make up for and bring in more manpower, make up for, for aged apparatuses that we have within the district, and prepare for the expansion of 60 Rayburn Highway and, the, uh, as, as was discussed early, earlier, the land use plan that was rolled out. And we, as a board, have looked at that land use plan and are trying to prepare for any future development within the district. I thank you for the time. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Tanner. 
Thank you. Uh, I think we have uh, some of the other fire chiefs here to support you. Is that true? Yes. Uh, if one of them or two of them would like to say a few sentences. Can I get five minutes? <laughs> <laughs> Are you related to Jerry Bender? Just kidding. <laughs> no, I'm not related to Jerry Bender. <laughs> Good, good evening, everyone. Uh, I just want to speak on behalf of the Fire Chiefs Association. Uh, I have personally attended District 7 meetings. I commend their Board of Commission that this parish council has put in place. I ask you to trust the people you appointed that they did their due diligence. We should not be putting public safe, safety in jeopardy. We should be looking at the growth, which was talked about tonight, and be proactive. Councilman Lorino uh, took some of the words out of my mouth when he said we're the fourth largest parish in the state. I must say that at least three times a week. But let's not forget we're the third fastest growing currently parish in the state. There's a reason people are moving here. They want what we have, and that's quality of life. It starts with public safety. And I commend the chief and his board for being proactive. Let's not fall behind like some of our neighbors. Let's be proactive and protect the people that choose to live in this parish and make public safety priority number one. I ask you tonight, I trust that you will vote to support District 7 in their proposal for this millage. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Uh, Councilman Loft. Oh, I'm sorry, Chief Moore, one more, that's fine. Good evening, Chief Rural Fire District 9, Bush and Sun area. I am Gary's immediate neighbor to the north. Gary and I have a very small rural fire department. My millage is 35. I need 35 as a minimum to protect my 100 square miles. Gary has almost twice that much. He's not asking for a lot. Gary and I share resources. He has a fire, we respond. We have a fire, they respond. We need each other. And tonight, they need you to support them. Please do so. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I would uh, like to make a motion uh, to approve this and also um, I realize the need and I think it's important that the people of the district get to vote on this issue. So I make the motion to approve. I'll second. Um, we still have a couple people in the queue, so um, uh, Arthur, if you want to go, go forward. Tell us yeah, um, Chief Whitehead, I had a couple just technical questions. So right now y'all are operating on one person crews, is that correct? That is correct. So you're, you're operating in a medical capacity as a first responder, not as an EMT or a paramedic? As a first responder with a single person on a truck. Okay. So if you're able to, um, if y'all succeed in this millage vote, would you be able to upgrade that service perhaps one day to EMT? Yes. Um, initially, we would, we would upgrade by placing two individuals or, or putting two firefighters at each station that we currently man, and then we would look at raising the level of service in, in addition to that, which would put us with more EMTs. And then my second question is, if, if y'all have the ability to provide a greater service, then your, re your, res your district's residence insurance rates will drop, hopefully. Yes, um, the, the plan would be is if we are successful with this millage election, that we would be able to reduce, which is an actual positive, our rating from a five to a three, which I, I did get some information from the state insurance commissioner that states that it would be a reduction in insurance, property insurance rates for all property owners within that, our area. And so you can say that fire districts are one of the few agencies and maybe the only agency that has the potential of saving individuals some money. And we could debate on how much money that would be, but save property owners some money on their insurance, property insurance, by being a better, more efficient fire department. And finally, I commend y'all as a former EMT and part of EMS for multiple years. I can't believe y'all are running on single unit calls. That's amazing. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Bender. Thank you. Uh, Chief, because I don't live in Fire District 7, okay, I, I really want to thank you. And I'm showing this to everyone because what it says is, is fact page, okay? And I gotta tell you, every bullet point provides essential information to all of us on the council 
uh, maybe even Ms. Tanner to some degree, but she, she's your council person. But for the rest of us, this gets me doggone close to about 100% sure I'm going to vote for you when it comes in a month. This is outstanding. I appreciate it. I do appreciate you, Chairman. Of course, my friend, Chief Kaufman. <laughs> well, he's out to get me tonight, Chief. You've got to have a talk with him. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. You want to say I, something, Jason Fargo? Uh, do, do, shall I clarify that one point? If you want to. I, I'll be glad, or I'll, I'll definitely allow you. But just, just uh, for a point of information, this is a resolution. It is up for adoption tonight, right. as opposed to being introduced and in, uh, for adoption at the next meeting. I wanted to be clear, wanted to be clear with you, Council Member. All right. Thank you. Councilman Canyon. Thank you. So, unfortunately, not everyone, I think, feels the same way about millages and when they should come due, when they shouldn't come due. Um, but, but I'm here to tell you, coming from an industrial background as a firefighter, firefighter for 14 years, I had access to all the best equipment, everything you could possibly think of. And the one thing that, that you learn when you go through this process, there's two kind of fires. There's fires you know what you're fighting, and then there's fires you have no idea what you're going into. Unfortunately for y'all, usually you have no idea what you're going in for. And as a standard, you've got to have at least three to five people to even think about attempting to go in a burning house, finding people, and putting out the fire. When you roll up with one person, it is probably it is the most dangerous thing I've heard in a long, long time. And your men should be commended because they haven't got hurt, and we haven't heard any bad thing. So... Saying that, I am extremely impressed. I think the people should decide whether they want better, and better coverage, more money. It, it shouldn't really be coming from the politicians because it's an election year. This should absolutely be given to the people to vote on because with the presentation and the situation, y'all absolutely need this now. This can't wait a year. This can't wait a day. So this, this needs to be voted on tonight. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, just one you quick earned remark. It. Uh, Councilman Davis. Yes, thank you. Just a quick, quick remark as an ex-safety officer. I mean, Chief, I have to say one thing. You're saving lives and you're also saving money? It sounds like a no-brainer to me. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. We have a motion on the second. Please vote. The motion is unanimous with no one absent. Thank you, Council. <clears throat> We have a uh, resolution, um, bond council resolution number seven, resolution CS number C6712, a resolution ordering and calling a special election to be held in the parish of St. Tammany State, Louisiana, to authorize the renewal of special taxes therein, making application to the state bond council and providing for other matters in connection therewith. Um, I do believe we have an amendment um, in consultation with the administration. Um, we are going to amend to remove the public health tax. Um, from being part of this resolution uh, pending a, a more in-depth campaign um, to, to flesh out the, the details and the needs for that. Um, so I have a motion to substitute. Um, make a motion to substitute. And uh, Councilman Smith uh, seconds. Okay. Um, do we want to vote on that substitution first and then before we vote to We have public comment. Let's go ahead and take public comment. We'll okay. Um, okay. I'll, I'll be quick. Uh, thank you again, Chairman. Jason Akers with Foley and Udell. Uh, with the amendment, this resolution merely uh, puts before the voters on April 29th 
a, a, an election to renew a tax levied for the benefit of the coroner's office. That tax is currently in existence. It's reaching the end of its previously authorized term. It, the request is to renew it at its currently authorized millage. Uh, with your vote today, we'll file the application with the State Bond Commission to obtain their approval, and it would be on the ballot for April 29th with your approval. So I'll step to the side because I believe there may be others. I think we have a card from C uh, Stephen Saucy. Sasu, maybe? Saucy. Saucy. Okay. I'm sorry, I couldn't read your writing. My name is Stephen Saucy. I'm a Abita resident. Uh, thank you for taking my time. Um, I'm hearing, listening to everyone talk about needing money, and I think we need to discuss the waste. Um, Y'all are all aware of the refusal by the taxpayers of St. Tammany regarding new taxes. Um, regardless if this is approved at the 3.1 mills, the coroner has the authority to raise that, roll that back up to four within two to three years. Um, for 20 years. Uh, the only way to assure the millage remains at 3.1 or less is to protect the taxpayers would be to go out for a new millage, not a renewal, unless you guys can lock this at 3.1 mills. At 3.1 mills equating to 7.7 .7 million, that equates to approximately 2.483 million per mill. Rolling up to four would generate an additionally 2.2 .2 million over the 7.7 .7 million already being collected. With growth in commercial, re with growth, commercial and residential, that figure grows. The coroner's office has approximately 10 million in reserve. That equates to more than 500,000 collected annually than warranted over the past 17, 18 years. There's enough money available to pay off all the remaining bonds, which would free up in approximately 700,000 annually, plus the additional 2.23 million, uh, if rolled back up, would be $9.9 .9 million. Prior to the coroner's office regaining its independence from the parish, uh, there was not a deputy coroner. There is one now that uh, was put in place after the independence. His salary went from 50000 within two to three months, went to 200000 plus benefits, costing the taxpayers an additional $250,000 a year. Um, Jefferson Parish has 200000 greater population, pays their deputy coroner $78,000. Uh, providing parishes outside St. Tammany Parish with autopsy services possibly cost the taxpayers millions of dollars of St. Tammany Parish. Um, again, a final answer cost to the taxpayers this is truly ethical. Justification of additional or second pathologist and deputy coroner may be warranted in the full-time capacity if, if the caseload uh, was warranted. Renewal of this millage with a roll-up possibly would generate a surplus of anywhere from 40 to $60 million in addition to what is needed to, to run the office. I ask you to look to your left and to your right and ask if this is really warranted and is it worth spending $250,000 to put this on the ballot when there has not been a forensic financial analysis done. Collectively, you guys have a chance to renew the trust with the citizens of St. Tammany Parish by conducting a forensic financial autopsy and determining the financial needs of the office. Provide the constituents with the service they elected you to do with compassion for the abuse that they have received and the wasteful spending over the past 20 years. We know what happened with the previous coroner. Determine what is warranted in the science of the coroner's office. The DA, the 22nd Judicial, we heard from the fire department, the jail, et cetera, obviously needs additional funding. Thank you for your time. I'll be more than happy to answer your questions. Yes, sir. Is that okay? Yeah, good. So, Mr. Saucy, uh, uh, I hear everything you're saying, and it's unfortunate. Dr. Preston, just so that everyone needs to know, he had uh, upper neck back surgery planned uh, about a month ago. About two days before he's going to have that surgery, he falls in his house and breaks his ankle. And so he actually had to have surgery by two different surgeons for a much longer period of time. He's home. He's, he's uh, rehabilitating. Mr. Saucy, I, I, uh, uh, I know that you, you were employed by the coroner's office for how long? I was there for a number of years, and I resigned when they made the decision to spend the $250,000. I understand. And what was your role? I was the administrative director of operations. Okay. So you made a decision to resign. Uh, I can tell you from being chairman in 2013, when we had to deal with the, the situation with the previous coroner, uh, there were many, many irregularities. Exactly. Uh, this council has noticed Dr. Preston coming before us at least twice a year. The fact is the millage has been rolled down from 4.0 to 3.1.
there's no indication that the man would ever do what you're saying, okay? Uh, and I would think that if that were the case, the people would readily vote him out of office, okay? That's just my opinion. Uh, it, it seems that you're pretty determined to give us the worst case scenario. I'm not sure what that's about. I'm only going by the fact that what, it, what the man has done speaks for itself. And he's been, excuse me one second, he's been in that role now for going on nine years. And we've seen what he's accomplished. I'll also tell you, because he's not here for the council's sake, he has what's required by the CAFR for an uh, audit. Why has he not had a forensic audit? It's very simple. He's had clean audits, okay? You get a forensic audit when a state legislative auditor comes in and says, we need to do a forensic audit. So that's not something that is done to the pub public. Uh, the next thing is, in the next few years, he has some very, very expensive, like three to $4 million equipment that has to keep DNA, all of the DNA that's been captured to keep it recovered properly, to, to keep it in, in a very, very cool environment. It can't be out of it. The same thing with autopsies, and, and I'm told all of that equipment will cost three to $4 million, and his surplus is in that range because that's what he needs besides what good accounting practices requires for enough money to support that office for so many months. So thank you for answering my question, Mr. Well, Saucy. Mr. Bitt, I have a great deal of respect for Dr. Preston. I've known Dr. Preston for over 35 years, and the majority of that DNA equipment was purchased by grants. 96% of the DNA done by the DNA lab of St. Tammany Parish Coroner's Office is done for who? Mr. Law, law enforcement. So I'm, I'm not, I'm not arguing. Mr. Saucy, I, 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 I just don't fully understand. It, it seems to me that just about all of us here can sense that, that you, you have some, a, a real issue with the coroner's office. And it, it's one of the finest run. I mean, he's out in the public constantly. He's at all of these accidents and so forth. And we also all know any assistant district attorney would tell you that nowadays the people expect DNA evidence. I mean, we just saw where having his own DNA lab allowed these poor people and family and friends of the, the two people that were viciously murdered in Covington. He was able to get the results. He gets the DNA results. I think we know that the pe police collect the evidence. But he got those DNA results out in two to three days after receiving it. So I don't have any the DNA. I'm okay, you just the, don't I'm trust that he would roll the millage up to 4.0. No, I'm talking and about I the, do. The, the current cost of operating the office versus what is being collected. And it's all a money issue. I, I, I have faith that the 3.1 mills will continue to be rolled down just like it's been rolled down in the past over the years by Dr. Ga Dr. Uh, uh, Preston. Well, but they, I appreciate your views. Assess, the assessor rolls it, and no, as well, it's rolled well, down, the millage, the, the volume, the dollar volume goes up as the millage is going down. Mr. Saucy, you, you're not Cousin even Bender, understanding uh, the roll up, roll back. That's controlled by the, by the coroner. He can roll up regardless Correct. of what the assessor does Correct. or roll down. Correct. He's rolled down. So, thank you. I appreciate okay, thank it. You. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Canulet. Thank you. Um, so, I, 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 I kind of have an issue with, with some of this. I uh, got a, a memo in my hand and uh, telling me why we should hold off on villages this year, which, which I do not agree with. Um, but I, I do agree with, with, with some of the things. So I, I guess I really have a question for the administration. Knowing that, that, that the, the public health millage is going to come due, 
knowing the issues we're having with, with the sheriff and the DA and the, the budget, and this impacts that tremendously, can someone explain to me why we're not ready and we want to push off the public health millage renewal? Because this, this is very important to people that, that need this health, that they don't have the access, they don't have the money. Yeah. So I'm, I'm looking for an explanation of why we're not ready for that. Thank you. I can, uh, it, you want me to if, if you want to. Okay, uh, to answer uh, Councilman Kenyulet's question, uh, we've talked to administration, mm -hmm. and at this time, we feel that there's some work that needs to do, be done on the public health uh, tax before it's put on the ballot for renewal, and we would like to work with administration and bring back to this council uh, the wording, proper wording in the ordinance to uh, make sure that we have addressed all issues. So when? It will probably be the end of the year, I'm just guessing. So Okay. I, I appreciate that, that but, but, you know, like I said, this, this is very important to the parish. And j just to not be ready is, I, I'm having trouble with that part. We're just not ready. We, we, we should be ready. For, when millages come up, we should be ready. It's our job to get the millages out to the people with explanations of, of what they do. It's not our job to hold them out for a year. It's what we're elected to do. The people get to decide whether there's going to be fire to district number seven gets anything or the public millage or the coroner. That's up to the people. That's not up to the council. But I, I want to just imply that the next millages we have coming up, let's please be ready because it's very hard for us to pass millages, as we all know. So, so that's what I want to say. Thank you. Gene and Hayes, if you would like to talk. Yeah. I just wanted to first say that right now we were talking about the coroner's millage. We weren't speaking about the public health millage. But when it comes to the public health millage, we're, we're not ready for it yet because it's not expiring just yet. And we, there were some things that we wanted to take care of, some educational information we wanted to get out to the public so people understand exactly what the public health millage is used for. And because it, that, that millage is not expiring just yet, we weren't prepared to put that out to the public just yet because we want to make sure the public understands everything that they need to know before going to the polls instead of just sticking something out there that they don't have any information on. Okay. Okay, the, thank so, you. So I'm, I'm going to hold you all to task at the end of the year. We're going to have the explanations and, and ready to roll. And, and also just to say that the, the, uh, the method of putting something on the ballot for, for an election is relatively complicated, and the deadlines kind of go out pretty far. So in a lot of times, this was sort of a placeholder until we, we kind of nailed down exactly when we wanted to do it. So, All right. Um, Thank so you. I think we have a, a motion and a second on the substitute motion. Um, this will be just to remove the public health tax and just have the coroner's tax. Please vote. The motion is unanimous with one absent. All right. And now we need to have a uh, vote on the substituted ordinance. Resolution. Resolution. Sorry. I make the motion. Second. <laughs> Councilman Tanner made the motion. Uh, <laughs> Councilman Candulet, <laughs> please vote. Come on. Ms. Casabon, Mr. Lorino. The motion is unanimous with one absent. All right. Uh, appeals next. All right, moving to appeals. For appeals, the speaking time per side is 10 minutes with three minutes of rebuttal. Um, appeal number one, Rosalind Dufresne, Nancy Erst, and Gordon Johnson appealing the Zoning Commission approval on July 5th 
2022 to rezone 3.13 acres located on the southwest corner of Harrison Avenue and Ravine Street, Abita Springs, from A2 Suburban District to ED1, Primary Education Holding District, Ward 3, District 5, uh, case number 2022-2886, ZC, Petitioner Jeffrey Shane, owner Silverback Holdings, LLC. Uh, this was postponed from 8491 11, 3, and 12, 1. Uh, Mr. Shane. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good evening, Council. Jeff Shane of the Jones Fussell Law Firm. I represent the petitioner in this case uh, and have been under the assumption that this case would be postponed this evening by Councilman Taladonna. I understand that uh, he is away from the chamber at this point, but I feel confident in telling you that he advised me this afternoon that his intention was to move forward and seek a postponement for one month until next month. I realize I'm not an appellant. There may be appellants in the room that feel otherwise, but I feel you need to have the benefit of that information. Uh, what, what I'll do is I'll, I'll just move you to the back. Oh, okay, here's your Okay. This Poor to me. The <laughs> has arrived. I, I didn't run. I, I, I went to Popeye's to get some meat. I'm hungry. It was too, no, no, I'm sorry. I, thank you very much. I didn't realize you'd come up so quick. So I congratulate uh, us for moving the agenda forward. Uh, it, it was very critical that in this, in the, in the component of this particular project, that a traffic study be done, and I asked for a traffic study. That traffic study now has been completed, but not reviewed. So on that basis, I'm going to move to postpone. Thank uh, you very motion much. Motion by uh, Councilman Taladano. And to apologies for, for having stepped out. Uh, uh, that's one month, Councilman Taladano. I think one month should be adequate. Okay. And seconded by Councilman Davis. Please vote on the postponement. The motion is unanimous with three absent. Before I go any further, are there any other ones that are postponed tonight that we can maybe move forward? Oh, okay. No such luck. All right. <laughs> Appeal number two, uh, Bo Bryan appealing the Zoning Commission denial on November 2nd, 2022 to rezone 3.010 acres located on the north side of LA Highway 22, east of Bell Point Drive, west of Perilou Road, Madisonville from HC1, Highway Commercial District to HC2, Highway Commercial District, Ward 1, District 1, uh, case number 2022-3068-ZC, petitioner Bo Bryan, owner Highway 22, Perilou, LLC, Bo Bryant. Um, Smith. Hi, my name is Allison Bondurant, and I'm here on behalf of Mr. Bryant and the landowner and developer of this property. Um, we are here. I'm going to uh, hand up to the council. These are uh, copies of plat maps and other information. There's a copy for each of you all. Um, related to this development. Um, we are here tonight to request an appeal of a zoning decision to deny the change of zoning from HC1 to HC2 for a 3.0 acre tract of land located at the corner of Highway uh, 22 and Perilou Road in Madisonville. Um, at this time, after some discussion with um, the neighboring landowners, one of the things that's going to happen here is that We've uh, agreed to amend our application to reduce the total uh, amount requested for the HC2 designation by 0.7 acres, so from three acres to about 2.3 uh, acres, um, which I'll explain how that fits into the development plan. Um, this is a piece of property that we requested rezoning on because the uh, developer of this property intends to add a takeout window for a pizza place in a four bay small shopping center that's going to be located right outside of Bell Point subdivision at the corner of Perilou Road and Highway 22. Um, the sole reason for the request was to accommodate the, the takeout drive through window situation. Um, the development that's proposed at this time, it's, a, it's actually two parcels that are subdivided, but uh, parcel one is being developed with an 8,500 square foot building that has four bays, which is well under even the HC1 20,000 square foot uh, requirement isn't coming anywhere close to the requirements for HC2, and there's no plans for that development. Um, at the zoning meeting, there was a split decision five to five on this, so we had to appeal. Um, and the neighboring landowners from Bell Point subdivision and one additional uh, landowner 
um, raised objections to the subdivision on the concerns of, well, what else could be developed? Because, of course, HC2 allows a lot other types of developments than uh, just a takeout window, which is what our client wants. Um, so in an effort to accommodate the needs and desires of the neighboring landowners, we met with those neighboring landowners, including the subdivision president, and uh, so, and we have spoken with other neighboring landowners. We went with Mr. Dean, this is his council district, to try to address any, any issues of the constituents. We agreed to enter into a deed restriction, which is in the packet that's being uh, passed out to each one of you all. So that um, we basically asked the the neighboring uh, development Bell Point subdivision, which this is right in front of, uh, what do you what do you want? What kind of uh, restrictions would you like? And they said these are the ones we want. And we said okay, we put in some deed restrictions. We've prepared those deed restrictions. They're attached in your packet. They're ready for execution. Mr. Tony Jambon, who is the uh, president of the subdivision association. Um, is in fact, you know, he has uh, assured us the subdivision is approved. They have provided a letter that's in the packet for you tonight. I understand someone here from the council, from the association, is going to speak on this issue. But we have reached an agreement with them about these restrictions in order for them to give their acceptance of this particular development and the, the plan that's set forth. So we have managed to accommodate all the needs of the neighboring landowner for the addition of the takeout window, which our client wants, which requires the change to HC2. Um, so that handled um, the immediate uh, adjacent neighborhood uh, landowner. Um, the rezoning also affects other landowners who are adjacent who had complaints about um, traffic in the area. This Paraloo Road, I'm sure the council knows, is an area that is in need of some upgrades. Um, and there's concern about the existing potential plan for the driveway access that we have prepared. If you review the site plan that we have provided on the front, the proposal that we are going to seek permitting on has a front driveway on Highway 22 um, and an additional driveway that exits onto Paraloo Road. Um, the reason for the two accesses is that it is um, we are working on permitting for a driveway on Highway 22 with DOTD, and there's a traffic study in the works for this property, which is all going to be required for us to get any of this done. Um, but that front driveway is almost assuredly going to be a right turn in, right turn out only onto Highway 22. So in order to provide left turn access that is safe, um, we would have uh, constituents or clients customers turn onto Paraloo Road and turn left onto the driveway that is on Paraloo Road. If you look at the site plan, we've also pulled that driveway farther back on the back side of the property. That is an attempt to um, be prepared for what we understand is going to be a traffic circle that is going to be located at the corner of Paraloo Road and Highway 22. So our development is set up in anticipation of the future improvements that will be there. Um, as you will also see on that site plan, we have agreed to restrict and amend our application to reduce the amount that we're requesting HC2 on so that only the front portion of the property is going to be HC2. The rear 89.4 feet or 89 feet 4 inches is uh, going to be and remain HC1. It's, going to, it's intended to be a green space anyway, and so our client was very happy to provide that concession to the neighboring landowners. So we are here to request the rezoning. We've provided um, you know, accommodations to the adjacent Bell Point subdivision, and we have um, set up and arranged the site plan to accommodate the traffic issues in the area. Uh, infrastructure seems to be the word of the night. Um, and so I've heard it a number of times. And our goal is to minimize the impact on the neighboring landowners of the traffic on this, on this particular shopping center. Um, it should be noted that um, this is providing a ser services in the, the, the types of services that will be in this particular shopping center, which is only four bays, a takeout pizza place, a small sit-down restaurant, and an in and out urgent care type place. Um, this area is relatively underserved in those types of uh, services right near where all these people actually live. So the goal is to provide the services right and their neighbor right next to their neighborhood so that they don't have to use Paraloo Road to drive up to town to go get anything done. This actually is a benefit to them in that case. In addition, it should also be noted that the proposed driveway that has 
is going to be talked about and is one of the issues that the, the association even does raise as a potential concern, even though they don't object to the subdivision, um, is the fact that this the permitted driveway has to be subject to a traffic study. It has to be subject to DOTD approval and to the permitting process. And it is the kind of thing that would be allowed under the HC1 designation or the HC2 designation. So the, the distinction in the zoning does not actually change this the whether the driveway is, is permissible or not. So while that may be the concern of why you shouldn't extend this to HC2, it's actually something that would be allowed under either of the two um, subdivision classifications. So we wanted to make a note of that in case there is an objection, which we anticipate there may be, based on that driveway that's located on Paraloo Road. Um, I think that's all that I have to give at this point. The, uh, if you look at the packet, you'll see that the limitations that we've agreed to with the uh, neighboring landowners are significant. The, good, the things people don't want in their backyard, no sea stores, no liquor stores, no clubs, no veterinary clinics with exterior kennels, no hotels, no uh, outdoor retail storage. You know, we really want to be good neighbors. Uh, our clients have spoken well with the neighboring association. I've actually spoken with the other landowners. And we've done our best to accommodate their wishes, and I believe that we have. So I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have, um, but I think that's it for now. I have one card, David uh, Wyndham, but it doesn't indicate whether you want to speak for or against her, but come on up. And Thank you, Council. My name is David Wyndham. I am one of the neighboring landowners. I'm sorry, are you speaking in favor or against? Just want to know for the time. Or I'm speaking against the driveway, okay. which I realize that is not going to have an impact on the changing of HC1 to HC2. I'm just asking that the council take into effect whenever they're, whenever they're allowing for these developments to be developed, look at the impact that it's having on the immediate area. Paraloo Road is a substandard road to 16 feet wide. My garage door on my house is 16.5 feet wide and I would never drive two cars in or out the garage simultaneously. The school buses have to stop on Paraloo Road to allow another bus to pass. And by putting this driveway in this commercial development there, I can only imagine that we're going to have delivery vehicles on Paraloo going into the back of these buildings to deliver to them. And in my opinion, we're just going to create an additional problem with the infrastructure that we have to deal with in this parish. Perhaps since Highway 22 is becoming a major commercial corridor, the parish needs to look at widening Highway 22 and putting turning lanes. I don't know if that's a solution, a possibility or not. But I don't think putting commercial traffic on Paraloo Road is going to help any of the local community. The mailboxes, including my own, are mounted in the ditches because we have no shoulder. Some people have put their mailboxes in flower pots so that whenever they get knocked over, they can stand them back up and continue receiving mail. We get pretty creative, but I don't think putting more traffic on Paraloo is going to help the community. And that's all I've got to say. So, thank you. Uh, well, do we have more? Okay, he didn't put a card in, but we can. Unfortunately, uh, Tony's son got involved in an accident around four this mo this afternoon, and uh, he had to run up to uh, up upstate a little ways. Uh, his son's fine, but he has a statement here that he wanted me to read. An address too. Uh, we don't have a card on. You, Mark so. Newpower, uh, 436 Bell Point Drive. Thank you. Part of the Bell Point subdivision. Uh, real. So I'm gonna just read this. What and I'm using Tony's name and everything. Good evening. My name is Tony Jambon, and I reside in Bell Point subdivision. Presently serving on the HOA board as president. I want to thank the council for allowing me this opportunity to communicate some concerns and commitments. I'm sorry. In comments regarding the front entrance area into our neighborhood. It is our understanding the sole purpose of the zone change request is due to one of the committed tenants request a drive-through window. Our community has no objection to this development having a drive-through window and remaining a HC1 zone. Due to the parish insisting a zone change from HC1 to HC2 without restrictions, Bell Point opposes this request and HC2 zoning exposes 
future land use options not welcomed by the front entrance area immediately adjacent to Bell Point subdivision. Mr. Bryan has expressed his willingness to respect our uh, objections and offer deed restrictions to limit concerns with this property in the future beyond his control if ownership changes. We feel this would be a fair compromise and acceptable regarding the rezoning request from HC1 to HC2. Another point I would like to express to the parish is the relative Highway 22 traffic concerns beyond Paraloo LLC's immediate control, more of a general observation. Referring to the parish's own written New Directions 2040 Comprehensive Plan, in the section of the Paris Vision and Guidance Principle, it states the following. Our infrastructure networks should be reliable and <coughs> resilient to safety and effectively more to move water, people, freight, and other services. Also in the New Direction 2040 Comprehensive Plan, the population change in, waste in West St. Tammany went from 200% uh, to 293% change in the population. Shouldn't this specific highway corridor of the infrastructure be considered priority for funding to provide safe and adequate highway access and not require mandatory secondary access. It is understood infra infrastructure improvements are scheduled out, but completion of the improvements are two or three years out from today. The lack of planning and coordination between the parish and state during the period of population growth has apparently created safety concern by the DOTD of providing a safe ingress and egress from Highway 22 into newly proposed development. This has resulted into the state requiring developers to include a secondary access or driveway into the commercial property. If the property is zoned commercial along the highway, the highway infrastructure should be significant to provide safe highway access. It shouldn't require infringing on other roads, parish or private, to accommodate commercial development. Thanks for providing this opportunity to express our concerns as St. Tammany resident. Hope this feedback provides perspective that can help lead to the rest of, to help lead to the best decision moving forward for every for everyone. Respectfully, Tony. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, we have three minutes for bottle. Thank you, council members, for uh, taking the time to hear this appeal. Um, I'm gonna address the two concerns that were raised, both in the letter from Mr. Jambon, which we anticipated, we spoke about it, it was in our packet, and also the, the, uh, the concerns of the other neighboring landowners. Again, the driveway at issue is not an issue of HC1 versus HC2, it's just not. That's, not, that's gonna be part of the traffic study and the permitting process. And we've done everything we can to reduce the impact on the neighboring landowner. Um, again, this uh, rezoning is simply uh, to accommodate that drive up window, which we can't do through a variance or any other means that's not allowed anymore. Um, we have the neighboring uh, subdivisions approval and we've given them all the restrictions they want. So we do request today that the, the council approve the, or. Uh, grant the appeal and grant the rezoning uh, to HC2 for the front portion of the property as indicated on the property uh, plat map that you have, which would leave the rear 89 feet approximately, uh, which is 0.4 acres and 0.22 acres on the two parcels. That would leave that portion as HC1. Um, thank you. There's three minutes of a bottle if... Um Mr. Wyndham or wants to talk, are you good? I'm good. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> um, we have, I know this is in uh, Councilman Dean's district, we have Mr. Lorena and Mr. Davis, would you like them to go first? I'm sure they have some very, very, very brief comments. <laughs> yeah, all right, Mr. Lorena. <laughs> all right, go ahead. They... All right, okay, all right. Uh, first off, uh, this is a very interesting, uh, predicament. Uh, as we know, Highway 22 is a state highway, number one. It's not a parish highway, and no matter what we try to do, we must go through the state and have their approval to do anything. Going through the state slows it down. You've heard me say from sitting in this seat, five years, now I'm going on six years waiting for those roundabouts to start, that previous administration and this administration have put forth at the RPC to the state. 
<laughs> and they haven't started yet. That is not a parish issue. That's not a parish issue. We have, we have it going to be widened. It will be widened from the Tangible Hill line up to Paraloo with a, a turning lane. I'd like to tell you it's going to start tomorrow, but as I said, six years. But a very important, no, well, let me stay on, uh, this is very important. Paraloo Road is a safety hazard. I can't, I can't argue with that. But every day, people transverse Paraloo Road because they're used to it. I would hope that, well, we just did some redistricting, I believe, Marty, didn't we? I think I, I, think I get that now, huh? if I get reelected. But anyway, <laughs> but the bottom line is we need to, Paraloo is not a state road. Paraloo is a parish road. And we need to find funds like we find funds for other things out of the clear blue for a very important project. Paraloo is a very important project, along with Brewster Road. Same concept. So from there, I'm going to work on that. But the bottom line is that's a bad thing. But this project is totally the driveways just because of the roundabout, if it ever comes. You have to move it. And it's just one of those things. But I'm going to support it, but I realize, and I'm going to do everything I can on Paraloo Road, as, as I know Marty will. But we need to find some funds for that. So I just wanted to say that. Thank you, Jimmy. Mr. Davis? Yes. Uh, it sounds like to me, the, again, it sounds like to me, you're not increasing the square footage of the building, right, from H over an HC1 capacity. Correct. It's vastly under an HC, even the HC1 designation. Okay. That's correct. So, all right. So that, that, that helps me out a lot. And But you're saying that then the really only reason is for this drive-through window. That's correct. Okay. Let me ask some, something. You, you plan on having a medical uh, part of the the, the uh uh, of the buildings be for medical use, Urgent right? Urgent care. Okay, and office. the other part's going to be for a restaurant. Correct. That's not associated with the with the pizza place. Correct. Okay, why don't you just sell pizza at the medical at the restaurant? Can we sell it at the medical clinic? No. Uh, maybe we we'll just do sell, it all online. Sell the pizza at the restaurant and have the people drive up and pick it up. Yeah, I, that was actually raised at the um, that was actually raised at okay. the zoning commission well, meeting. No. And what I said is that people love their takeaway. As a mother of three children, right. I didn't want to wrestle my toddler out of their seat in the minivan when I'm on the way home and they're crying and it's raining like it's rained in the past week. And I know all the moms that drive up and down Highway 22 don't want to wrestle their child out of the uh, out of their minivans and to go so they can go in to pick up. The takeout right. out window actually provides a service that people really want. Right. They love takeout. They love being able to drive up in their car and pick it up. Well, I understand. So I understand that, but you can sit it. in the car and have somebody from from inside of the pizza place do, uh, bring it to your window, charge it, and get it going. I mean, all that to change the zoning from HC one to say HT two. That's a pretty big zoning change, and I understand about all these. Uh, <clears throat> I understand about all these deed restrictions, but uh, as Martha can can say too uh, about deed restrictions, we're not even supposed to get on, uh, on deed restrictions. That's left up to the public Correct. to come after you guys if you break these deed restrictions. Well, the benefit of the deed restriction for the landowners is I, that it's perpetual. I, I, I understand. It's I understand the benefit of zoning it, change, you know? and so we. It's just unfortunate. There's no way we could have done something with an HC one and granted a variance for this one case. That's why you know I think right. these, you know and it's I, unfortunate. I actually that. think that there's going to be a movement to address those types of issues on a go forward basis yes. because there are these kinds of little things sure. that you really need conditional and use. We would love the conditional use. Um, um, but unfortunately, we're in the position that we don't have it okay. at this Thank point. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Smith. Okay. It's great you guys are trying to work with people, and it sounds like a worthwhile project, but I drove a truck for FedEx, and I was a courier, and if you've got a driveway on Paraloo, they're going to go in and out of that driveway. And they're going to take those trucks in and out of that driveway. And it doesn't sound to me like Parallel is wide enough to really handle that. So as long as that entrance and exit is there, it, don't, it doesn't look like a good thing to me. Councilman Dean. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, 
Let's see. I was thinking back, and, I, and I've been on the council going on 20 years. 20 years ago, if you're familiar with uh, Highway 22, and I'm talking about just basically from Madisonville to the parish line, you got Gust Island subdivision, Grand Oaks subdivision, Autumn Creek, Bell Point, Timber Lane, Rayford Oaks, Black River Estates, Black River Forest, and on Highway 1085 that intersects uh, 22, you have a bunch of uh, lots of record where people have built. You got um, Paraloo that, uh, that goes into 22 where a lot of people have built on lots of record. So you got a lot of, a lot of people. Um, I remember driving that when we were doing uh, re the comprehensive rezoning and I, was, I, I asked Sid DeFontenot, the previous um, planning and zoning guy, if he would ride out there with me. And, um, which he did, and we just got to, I said, Sydney, what are we gonna do with this, with 22? Because it was just like everywhere. You had, it was kind of like Collins Boulevard or whatever. Uh, could I? Um... <laughs> Thank you. Um, so and it, it was just kind of, it was like everywhere. You got some industrial stuff, you got boat storage, you got all kind of stuff out there, but not very much commercial. So we decided each one of the uh, intersections uh, would, would need some commercial there. So we decided on 8, 8C1. We didn't think about the fact that 8C1, and to me, with this is gonna be something we gotta jump on ASAP. We've already talked about the different levels of, of uh, drive-throughs, whether it be a bank drive-through or a McDonald's or uh, whatever, PJ's Coffee or whatever. Um, we, gotta, we gotta be able to allow that in 8C1 so we don't have to get in this situation again. What I think that, that the, uh, the um, the owners did, the landowners, the petitioners did, was do the best thing that they could do. Uh, we asked them if they would dedicate or, or like, yeah, dedicate the back of the properties to, to remain uh, HC1. So they're only ask, asking for HC2 to the uh, southernmost property that abuts Highway 22. Um, the issue is, of course, and everybody, I promise, everybody I've talked to on both sides, the issue is, um, Paraloo Road. Uh, Paraloo Road is a substandard road. We've paved it a couple of times, so it's nice. You know, it's a, it, you're not gonna bump around a lot on it, but it's very narrow from Brewster Road going south. I talked to Jay uh, Watkins, uh, Watson the other day, uh, and, and he's supposed to be getting kind of some ballpark figures about what it would take. It, it was gonna, it's gonna be an expensive project. Uh, it's gonna take some subsurface drain, uh, road drainage, you know, and I think we were talking the other day, some of them still are on septic system, some of them are on. So I'm gonna be speaking with the president and hopefully over the next little, very short while, we'll get some plans um, uh, on on uh, uh, Paraloo Road. Um, I appreciate the deed restrictions. Uh, there's a certain portion of the project that won't be able, won't allow alcohol because you are close to a church, I mean, not a church, a school. Um, so I appreciate the, the cooperation between all of them. I think the issue mainly uh, in between, with, with Bell Point and uh, with Mr. Wyndham, I think, is, is Paraloo Road. And I think we need to kind of uh, you know, follow the traffic study and see where that goes from there. So with that, uh, I'd like to make a motion to override the zoning's uh, denial. No, I said uh, motion by Councilman Dean, second by Councilman Lorino. Please vote. So, so a yes is to override, is to override the denial. The motion passes with 12 yeas and one nay. Thank you. And then we need a, we need an uh, introduction of an ordinance. So moved by Councilman Dean, second by Councilman Lorino. And then we just, that's all we need, correct. All right, moving on to appeal number three, Terrace Bergeron appealing the Zoning Commission approval with waivers on November 2nd, 2022 on a parcel of land located on the east side of Highway 21 north of Pinnacle Parkway, Covington with a lot use size of 4,130 square feet for the proposed use of a take five car wash, colon planned construction, currently zoned HC2 Highway Commercial District in the Highway 21 planned corridor, Ward 1, District 1, uh, case 2022-3064-PR, petitioner BSREP, Two Cypress TRS LLC, Michael Blank, owner, BRS, 
EP2 Cypress TRS LLC Michael Blank. Mr. Bergeron? Uh, yes, sir. That's a heck of an introduction. So <laughs> I got a little. <clears throat> Got a little lost there. So yeah, my name is Terrence. Uh, I live at 3 Begonia, which is um, <clears throat> property just on the other side of a um, commercially zoned district. Um, there's two proposals, one a Tommy's car wash and this uh, Take 5 car wash, literally neighbors. So obviously um, having such uh, proposed noise on the other side of our fence, not to mention water uh, issues and other potential issues uh, from such uh, businesses uh, to be erected there are you know, is very concerning to us. Everything from health to uh, potential and, and very real loss of property uh, value, as you can imagine, a, a nice home sitting next to a um, you know a noise making factory, as as it will be, uh, would 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 most likely uh, you know uh, well, we can lose hundreds of thousands of dollars there, so it's very concerning. But I I, I actually had some pleasant surprises. Uh, we're we're in the moratorium. I think everybody knows that on these car washes, and I've been told that number one by uh, Councilman Dean that um, whatever uh, the moratorium produces in terms of uh, new ordinances uh, will be upheld. So that's, uh, that's, that's good, and I appreciate that. Also, I spoke to Mr. Paul, who's representing the uh, Take Five uh, folks. Uh, he was very friendly and receptive to some uh, new ideas that I brought to him tonight, uh, which I've actually outlined here. He wanted me to submit this to you guys, but I'll just explain what this is before I uh, hand it over to you, and then I'll, I'll turn it over to him. Um, so. Obviously, beyond some of the health issues and wanting to make sure that the studies are, are, are solid in terms of the water usage and where all of this excess water and, and chemicals goes, because we drank the groundwater there, so that's extremely important. And that, again, will come out in the, uh, in the moratorium. The other main issue is, is the noise. And so what these, uh, you know, the um, Take Five folks have proposed is a 416-foot-long, 12-foot-high sound barrier, which sounds like a lot and certainly would be very expensive, probably to the tune of $100,000 itself, as I've priced just fencing uh, for a distance like that, and it's, it's very expensive. So I appreciate that. Um, the problem that we have is, and, and you probably won't be able to see it unless you have this, this is directly out of what they've submitted, so you probably have all seen this. You see this long line down the side here. This is the fence. This is the property line division here, this long line that goes the whole length of this. Um, if they put the 12 foot tall fence there, two things uh, become an issue. Number one, it's going to actually reduce the size of the fence by probably four foot because of the, uh, when, when they start construction, they're gonna build up the ground and then put the cement on top of that. So that's what they're gonna build. And that's what all the commercial buildings have done. So a 12 foot fence becomes eight foot. All right, so we're gonna lose that obviously. And, and, and at that level, based on our research, my wife and I have researched sound, um, uh, sound barriers, that would do uh, nothing. Even if that eight-foot fence was much closer, it would do nothing. That's the second issue. The second issue is that this this line is in the middle of uh, my neighbor's house here uh, is uh, Miss Paula, who's with us here tonight, and then my house is, is up uh, above, uh, or the I guess you would say to the uh, north side. Um, so... Um, yeah, sorry. So this this uh, this fence position is in the middle of where the properties are, where the houses are, and where the noise is being generated. And our the studies that we've uh, that we found, sound kind of works like this. If you have the sound that's being generated too far away, it actually goes up and then creates the equal distance down, and it starts to affect again almost at the same volume, you know, that far away from uh, the structure that's in place. So you either have to have the fence or the, the sound barrier closer to the noise or close to the hearer to actually be effective. So we proposed this, where you can all see that swiggly yellow uh, uh, red line that I've drawn here. Uh, that'll put the fence, uh, the sound barrier, I should say, um, uh, in, in two more positive positions. Number one, it moves it 30 foot closer in general. Uh, at, at, and at positions up to 60 foot closer to the noise in general. So that's huge. And then at this position, which is right at the edge of uh, the proposed driveway that they have, it'll actually, if we can build it on top of, and I spoke to Mr. Paul about this, if we can build it on top of the uh, foundational elements that they build, you're getting the 12 foot tall fence plus the addition of the three to five foot elevation of the, uh, the foundation, which now creates a... Um, 
you know, a potentially a 15 to 17 foot sound barrier and much closer. So anyway, this is what we're asking um, to happen. Uh, his client, he's contacted them and they said they are definitely willing to uh, discuss this with us and potentially uh, put this into action. Uh, so that's, um, you know, that is some relief. So I guess what we're asking here is that we just make sure that we, you know, honor, uh, we'd ask you to honor the, um, uh, the, um, um, sorry, the, uh, I'm blanking on the word to use here. Um, the moratorium, honor the moratorium so that we can get through this, the water studies and such, but also uh, get to an agreed um, uh, you know, position and height of this wall, talking to sound engineers and that kind of thing. That's, that's what we're mostly asking for so that we, uh, you know, we can get through the process successfully. Happy to answer any questions. Um, should I submit this to someone? He, uh, Paul asked me to do it, or he can do it himself. Sure. Thank you. And that's the red line. Thank uh, you for your time. Appreciate it. We have uh, three other cards um, that they're in favor of the appeal. Um, they do not wish to speak. Paula Bennett, Tiffany Bergeron, and Jerome Smolinski. Um, assume you still don't want to speak, but we have your cards. Um, did you put a card in on this? Okay. Well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I apologize for not putting a card in. I, in fact, when I first got here, I, that's when I first met Mr. Bergeron, and we were kind of busy talking and trying to reach my client and so forth, so I neglected to do that. So I, I apologize. I'll fill one out before I leave this evening. Um, so just to, I'll certainly touch on what uh, Mr. Bergeron mentioned, and we did have a good conversation, um, and uh, that will go into what I'm going to ask you uh, to consider this evening. Uh, but just to give a little bit of background, um, this, this property – uh, is L-shaped. It is at the intersection of Pinnacle Parkway and Highway 21. Um, and uh, the site plan that I believe you probably have in the packet that was given to you will uh, illustrate that uh, we're only developing uh, one leg of the L, if you will. Only that portion that fronts Highway 21, the portion that actually goes north-south and that wraps around behind the Shell Station, uh, we are proposing to leave uh, in its wooded condition. Uh, so that will be a significant buffer that will be between the highway uh, and the residents to our rear. Uh, the Zoning Commission approved the request uh, for the plan review. Uh, of course, being a plan review, we're not here about the use of the land. That's permitted. It really is about the site plan uh, and how the site plan lays out. And uh, so the Zoning Commission approved the request. There were two issues. One, we had committed to a sound barrier along the back line. The staff wanted to see the engineering for that. And there were some questions about the landscaping. I'm happy to report that both of those issues have been resolved as far as the staff comments in our recent uh, resubmittal of the revised plans. So both of those issues have now been satisfied. Um, it's important to note that this project or this particular site is not proposing any access directly to Highway 21. We've heard a lot about traffic tonight. You hear a lot about traffic in all of your uh, land use cases. And we have the luxury of fronting on Pinnacle Parkway, so we have one access way set well back off of Highway 21 uh, with no new curb cuts on Highway 21. And I think that's, that's an important characteristic. Um, we have... Um, we have committed to the sound barrier, um, and it was asked uh, by some of the residents of Flowers Estates that we consider an eight-foot barrier uh, along the property line. We agreed to the eight-foot barrier, but agreed to go further and make it a 12-foot barrier. And it is not just, uh, it's not just a fence, and it's not just a wall. I mean, we've seen a lot of opaque fences, and we've even seen some cinder block walls placed. But what we're proposing, and we provided the specs to your staff, is an actual sound absorbing wall uh, that is designed to function for this exact purpose. Its material is such that it will absorb the sound. Now, I'm not a sound engineer, and I know Mr. Bergeron has some concerns about the effectiveness of that wall, uh, and I respect those concerns. And I, I relayed that to him today, and I relayed that to my client. But tonight, I want to be clear about two things. We are committed to doing that sound wall. Uh, doing a sound wall. Our plan shows it at 12 feet along the property line. The plan or the marked up plan that Mr. Bergeron submitted, which he showed me this evening, proposes that we do a shorter wall in distance, not height, a shorter wall, but closer to our facility. So kind of on the inside of our buffer. Right now we have 
about a 414 foot length wall that we're proposing along the back line. That's even along the back part of the property where we're not proposing any development. He's suggesting that we move it more interior uh, inside of that 35 foot buffer, um, which we are open to, to doing. We're open to exploring that. So what I would ask the council to consider, if you're inclined to uh, uphold the approval of the, the plan review approval by the Zoning Commission, that you include in that at least the opportunity for us to explore and move that sound wall from the back line, which we're fully prepared to do, to the place that is identified on Mr. Bergeron's plan. I've talked to my client, they're open to that. They need to explore that. Obviously, we need to make sure, and it would be subject to us being able to still meet all engineering and landscaping requirements of the parish. Ultimately, your staff would need to be comfortable with the location of that wall as it relates to everything else that's going on there. But as, as I told Mr. Bergeron, it, if, if this can be a win-win situation where he gets what he believes is happy, we're content that it still accomplishes our goal, then we want to have the flexibility to do that. Uh, tonight, I can't tell you, and I couldn't tell him whether we will or we won't do that, but we know that we're going to do a sound wall. We commit to you that we're prepared to build it on the back line, but we'd like the opportunity to work with him so that we might be able to place it as he's shown on his plan. So I, I ask for your consideration of that this evening. In sum, we're not here about the use. The use is, the use is allowed. Um, our site plan uh, was approved by the Zoning Commission. It meets all of your ordinance. In fact, it exceed, exceeds many of your ordinance in a positive manner. Our rear buffer is larger. Uh, we've got well more uh, green space on this site. About half the site is actually preserved in green space, which is a little unusual for a, for a commercial development along Highway 21. But because it's L-shaped, it's a little bit of an unusual piece. But so there are some there are some characteristics here that certainly are in compliance, but it's a step above what is what is required. Uh, with all that being said, uh, we'd respectfully request your approval this evening of our plan review, with the one caveat and the modification to include our flexibility to uh, to work with Mr. Bergeron and to maybe relocate that wall if it seems uh, feasible and appropriate uh, to him, to us, and to our engineers and your staff. We thank you for your consideration. I'll be happy to answer any questions that any of you may have at the appropriate time. Mr. Bergeron, you have three minutes for rebuttal if you'd like to speak further, if not. No, I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Mr. Dean. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, if, you, if you've been paying attention over the last probably six months, we've been discussing um, car washes that are but uh, residential, and it seemed like it's just kind of all of a sudden have been a, a real big uh, push for it. That would make if these three were to uh, if these two were to go up, that'd be three car washes within less than a quarter, well, less than probably half a mile radius. So uh, uh, you know there must be a lot of money in car washes. Anyway, having said that though, that we did place a moratorium, uh, and I think it's up probably around March. Not, what when is it? about March or April? I think it is uh, on car washes that abut uh, residential. The uh, reason is, and this one doesn't give me the heartburn that the other one uh, does, and, and I'm not going to speak to that, but this is the reason we had the, the uh, moratorium was to discuss what kind of buffers would we prefer or would we, would we mandate between it and the, um, and the residential area. Mr. Bergeron and his wife own a, own a house on Begonia that is just beautiful. Uh, it, it, the, the backyard is just pristine and as quiet and nice as, as you, as you uh, would ever want to see. And he's got a fence right there on the, on the, um, on the property where this car wash, uh, the, another car wash. So I'm worried, more worried about that one than this one. I appreciate the flexibility. Um, I, I did speak to with Mr. Marone <coughs> and, and everybody involved. Um, the, this car, I mean, this uh, sound barrier, I think, kind of would set the set the standard going forward for any loud business, and that could be car um, mechanic shops, whatever, any loud business that abuts um, uh, residential. Um, the, there's a lot of pluses about this. It empties out on Pinnacle uh, Parkway uh, instead of Highway 21. 
they are doing a lot. I think they're kind of going over uh, um, and above what, what we've asked them to do. They're leading, leaving a whole lot of tree buffer, plus they're pro proposing that, um, that sound barrier wall. All I do want to make sure, there's two things that I want to make sure, uh, Mr. Chairman, that everybody is aware of. One is this is a plan review, and so whatever we come up with the moratorium, these folks will have to, um, you know, ad adhere to those rules. So it's not all set in stone right now. So I think, and I've had a conversation with our attorney and with with the other folks involved. So you know, it, it, it's it's a it's a plan review, but there may be some other things that we want to take a look at. Traffic studies, um, that that maybe the colors of the place, whatever. So we want to uh, take a look at that. Uh, and the second thing is, I know that, that this is not going to be the end. I want to, uh, and I respect uh, Terrence's um, intellect for sure, because I've, I've, I've kind of been, I've been impressed with that. But I do know that whoever you buy a $100,000 sound wall from probably has an engineer who's going to make recommendations as well. So if having said that, if whatever you all want to work on together, and this probably what what Terrence says makes sense to me, <coughs> but what, whatever is going to make the best um, sound, <coughs> soundproofness, I, I think is the best. So before I choke to death, <coughs> I'm going to go ahead and make a, a motion to concur with the approval. Please. I'm second by Mr. Fitzgerald. Any further discussion? Seeing none, uh, please vote. <coughs> The motion is unanimous with no one absent. We just need an introduction. <coughs> Councilman Dean. Anybody second? Councilman Fitzgerald. All right. <coughs> Moving on to number four. Uh, Michael Allen appealing the Zoning <coughs> Commission denial on December 6, 2022, to rezone one acre of land located on the northeast side of Booth Road and Bessie Booth Road, Folsom, from A1 Suburban District to A1 Suburban District and MHO Manufactured Housing Overlay Ward 2 District 3 Case 2022-3110 ZC Petitioner Michael Allen Owner Deborah Allen Mr. Allen Yes sir you Thank 10 you all minutes. For, Thank you all for taking the time to uh, listen to me um, So what we're proposing is um, to have a, a mobile home on my mother's property um, A little history on that My dad um, he started in 1976, Aquarius Pools in this parish. And I'm not old enough to, to be able to say this, but anyone that is that's grown up in this parish knows in 1976 this parish was a lot different than it is now. There wasn't much here between Covenant and Mandeville. But he always took pride in saying, I had faith in this parish to start a custom pool, biz custom pool building business in this parish in 1976. People thought he was nuts. But over the last... 46 years, he, he quickly grew a thriving business, well-respected business, and built over 2,000 pools in this parish, <coughs> most likely for multiple people in this room. And, um, and two years ago, he had to step away from the business. Um, I, I've worked with him for 10 years, but the main reason is because of my mother. Um, she became sick. It's been a progressive thing, but she was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. Um, so he, he stepped away to take care of her. And they live on a 25-acre horse farm in Folsom. And uh, he was with her every step until July 5th this year. Unexpectedly, he passed away. So after he passed away, you know, most times when people pass away, you're mourning the death of your father. Me and my brothers, besides doing that, are immediately having to think, how are we going to take care of my mother? And uh, I'm 35, and one of the unique things about what my mother was diagnosed with is she has the rarest case of Alzheimer's, and one of the biggest indicators of that is age. She's only 67 years old. And looking back, the indicators showed us that she probably started with this disease in her late 50s. So a lot of people will say, move her in with you. You know, let her, let her live with you. She's lived on that farm for 25 years. And anyone that has dealt with this disease knows, knows that people are most comfortable where they know. 
And between me and my brothers, I have three kids, a seven-year-old, a five-year-old, a six-month-old. My brother has three boys. My third brother has two kids. And we, we, in the last six months, have been taking turns, taking care of her on weekends. But the biggest thing is, is her home. And when we go to stay with her at night, it, it gives her high anxiety. Loud noises, three kids, that's unavoidable, right? Um, loud noises, and just at some point, she just wants to, to have her home and not have all the chaos that you have with kids. Um, so what we're proposing is on, uh, on the property is to be able to put a mobile home to, to help care for my mother, to have a place where I can stay with my family, my brother who is here can stay, my, my third brother who lives in Lafayette who drives in once every three weeks to help us, you know, he, he comes in to help, and then at some point, the chaos, she gets upset and wants him to leave. Well, he can't just leave. He can't just go home. So what we're proposing is that, to have this here to help care for my mother. And, you know, I know it's not zoned for that. That's why we're asking for this. If you, if you turn on Bessie Booth Road and, and go up, there's a hill going up the road. The first thing you see when you turn on Bessie Booth is my mother's property right across the street from it is a mobile home. It's 25 acres. There's three mobile homes located on the south corner, the northeast corner, and the west corner of, of my parents' property. What, where, we're, where we're wanting to put it is on the 10-acre plot, but there's three plots of land, 25 acres total. So it's only for the care of a mother, but it's basically there's going to be a one residence and a mobile home on 25 acres. And that's just so we can take care of her and uh, take care of her needs. So that's what we're asking for. I know there's maybe people here that, that can test it, but you know, there's, from everyone that lives on that road, they drive past that mobile home every day. And, um, and honestly, when my dad passed away, that family in that mobile home was the only one that came to our doorsteps and asked what they could do for us. And um, you know, I, I don't think we're asking for much, especially what my dad has put into this parish and what he's what he helped grow this parish, in my opinion, and the respect he had for what he did, um, I'm not asking for much. You know, we're just we're just asking for a way to be able to take care of her. You know, with the the worst part about this disease is we don't know if it's going to be one year or five years, but the reality is at some point she's not going to be around anymore, and she's not going to know who I am. And the more time I can have with her, my kids can have with her and have her happy is what we're trying to do. Because when she comes to my house or goes to my brother's house, there's two questions she asks after an hour. When can I go home or I wanna go home? Because that's where she's been for 25 years. So my goal is to keep her there and keep her happy. And as long as I can have good times with her and get on horses and ride with her out there and spend time with my kids on that farm, that's what I wanna do with her. And this mobile home would dramatically increase for not just me, but my, my two brothers and their families, us to be able to do that. And for, you know, we have a caretaker that's with her during the day and just places for caretakers can, can go to. So we can all take care of her. That's all we're asking for. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, we don't have any other cards on that side. Um, Mr. Chase, Mark Chase. You have 10 minutes, sir. Thank you for hearing me. Um, in September of this year, my wife and I bought the property directly next door to the Allen's house. And uh, they have a beautiful place, they really do. We bought it partly for that reason and the, uh, the other homes in the neighborhood, the property values. We also learned in my research before buying it that the property directly behind the house I just bought had been denied mobile home use very recently. And the gentleman that spearheaded it was the boy's father. He did not want a mobile home in the area because it will, you know, um, affect property values of everyone in the neighborhood. I certainly respect what they're going through 
I've been through similar with my family. And I know how hard it is. But I can't see that changing everyone's property values in the area for, for this one reason is the answer. I feel they could bring in an RV or two RVs or a big RV for weekends. If, if that's the idea is to let the kids have a place to run and play, I think that's great. But changing one acre in a five acre minimum zoning and allowing mobile homes will affect all of us in the neighborhood. We put a substantial amount into purchasing our house and we've already begun putting a substantial amount into upgrading the property. So I'm very worried about introducing mobile homes. And I know if this passes, the fellow that has the property behind me, he'll be right back because it's gonna be open again to bringing mobile homes into the neighborhood. Um, both fellas live in beautiful areas of their own with covenants and restrictions. I can't imagine that if the property owner next door to them said, I want to change the zoning and put a mobile home on my property, that that, that would be OK. And I don't think anyone in their neighborhoods would be OK with that. There's got to be another answer. So I'm, I'm asking you, please, you know, don't let this pass. And because uh, it's going to affect a lot more than just, you know, one house. There's a group of us that live in that neighborhood that are all worried about this. That's what I have to say. Um, Mr. Allen, you have three minutes for rebuttal if you so choose. Okay, so the main things I guess I'd like to say is First, he is correct with my dad. When they were trying to put a one on a two and a half acre lot, he was against it mainly because the person had a long criminal record and he didn't want that person living on that property. Secondly, we're, we're asking for one acre rezoning. The reason for that is because when I went to the parish to apply for this, I told them it was gonna go on this 10 acre plot and they said, well, if you know where it's going, just apply for this one acre because you pay by the acre. You know, if, if y'all wanna have it for the whole 10 acres, I have no problem with that. We just did that because we know where we're putting the mobile home. It's not like we're trying to stack multiple mobile homes. And thirdly, I, I understand what the gentleman's saying, but if you stand in his driveway, you can see that other mobile home. You know, so it's, you know, when you, like I said, everyone drives by it every day. And, um, and like, again, like he said, uh, uh, how beautiful this property is. It's the, we keep this place immaculate. We have someone that takes care of it on a daily basis. It's not going to be any difference. We're not going to put a, a rundown mobile home on this property. It's going to be a new home, very nice, very well kept. It's, it's nothing that's going to, going to be an eyesore to, to anyone. And, um, and like I said, it's, it's one, it's going to be my mother's house and a mobile home on 25 acres. So we're not, we're not asking. You know, the two and a half acre plot he was talking about, that's all the property was. This is 25 acres we're trying to put it on. That's it. So, thank you. Mr. Chase, if you would, you have three minute rebuttal. The uh, property that he is speaking with across the street from his mother, um, I was not here when that was changed, although that is a temporary structure, the mobile home is, until they build a home, which I've heard they are about to break ground shortly. And uh, again, changing only one acre opens the door for the property owners and the rest of the area to rezone one down to one acre, which is not the intended land use of the whole area. So, you know, we, then we, that's all I have to say. Thank you, sir. Uh, Councilman Casbon, you're in the queue, but would we have Mr. Davis and Mr. Toledano? Would you Did like they them want to go speak first? first? Sure. Let them, they can speak first uh, if they wish. Councilman Davis? Yes, Mr. Allen? Could you come up, please? 
just so I can understand this right, so uh, your mother's going to stay in the home that she lives in now. Correct. And you're basically going to want to move in a manufactured housing uh, in there for yourself and for the visiting people who are going to be taking care of the mother, correct? Co correct. Okay, you're in an A1 zoning, so you could build a 1,000-square-foot mother-in-law's home. Why not do that? Because that's permanent, and um, realistically, our situation is not. You know, it may be one or two years, it may be five, but this is, this. like he said, that was temporary for them to build a house, even though it's been there for five years, that mobile home. One day we're going to face the reality that my mother's not going to be here anymore, and then at that point that mobile home is going to be pulled off the property. Or, or you could go ahead and just sell both both of those dwellings, and it'd be an incentive to the buyer. I mean, that way you don't have to have any rezoning. Say that again. If you have your mother's home, God bless her, if she passes mm -hmm. away, mm -hmm. instead of having a mobile home where you can just run in there, grab it, and leave, okay? First of all, you get to buy a new mobile home. Right. That's going to be a cost. Right. We've For a 1,000 square foot, you can build a separate building out there, stay there, and take care of your mother, and then, God forbid, when your mother passes away, you could sell the, all the property, and that would be a sales incentive well, to have we, a mother we don't, lost suite. We, we don't have any intention to sell this property. Uh, okay, It's gotcha. going to stay in the family's okay. family name. And <clears throat> so that's why we're looking at something that we can put out there that can be sold at some point because, you know, the – at, realistically, one day when she's gone, we, we don't need an, a, a, another house there, you see. Okay. And so to spend $200,000 on a, on a house out there with the cost of building right now, it would be foolish on okay. our part. I understand if we knew like one day we were going to sell this property, that, that's one thing but because it would raise the value, but we're not, we're not looking to do that right. ever. I was just trying to figure out a way you yeah. can do it without changing the zoning. That's right. all. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, Councilman Taladano. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Allen, I, I, I got to tell you that almost identical to what Mr. Davis said, I had already done some calculations. But, but I'm going to say this to you generally also. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't get it why you would even want to put a manufactured home on that property, nor do I believe that you're very uh, deep-hearted and uh, honest caring for your mother, which I think is totally commendable, can only be accomplished by doing this. I, I, I think, sir, in all due respect, mm -hmm. that the gentleman in the back who I don't know and never met makes a point well made that your dad opposed a manufactured home. I, I, I he just, did for someone with a criminal record. I, I got you. But whether he had a criminal record or a good housekeeping record, my mm. point is this. He opposed a manufactured home. Mm -hmm. I, I, I respectfully say to you that you seem like a very intelligent person. I, I, I presume your brother tracks you very well. I, I think you go back to the drawing board. I, I know the economics of this. I think you can probably – build a nice, very suitable home, as Mr. Davis described, as a mother-in-law home, you could build it for just about the same doggone price that my expert to my right, Ms. Casabon, tells me a good manufactured home might cost. I, I just think that in the long run, you do yourself and the neighborhood a service by doing something of that kind. Mm. in due respect to the situation of trying to do right by your mother. That's great. I don't think you're necessarily helping anybody, including yourself, by investing in a, a manufactured home. That's my opinion, sir. Okay. But thank you for what you had to say tonight. Councilman Casimal? Yes. Um, Michael, I know you – we – talked about this, you know, before y'all made the petition and mm -hmm. and my um, suggestions which to you were what had happened in the past that, yes, the trailer that is there, they were going to build sooner, but they are finally building. 
um, we did deny um, several in that area. Um, so we wouldn't change the zoning. And, and I gave you that information, you know, like I said, before you did the petition. Right. Um, I loved your dad. He did put in my pool. And, and if there's anything that I can do, but I cannot um, mm -hmm. agree to the trailer um, in, in that particular area because of the beautiful homes and, and the surrounding area. It, it's just the manufactured... Overlaid just does not fit that area. I'm going to uphold the the um, planning uh, or zoning commission's um, appeal. Okay, they go well with them. And uh, but if there's anything else I can do, I agree. You know, we talked about the different avenues that you could take. Right, and that, we, we've that, looked at them. I know. And, um, and financially, they're yeah. double. Yeah. But yeah. you know that's. And, you know, but, um, that's but that area, if this is where we're trying to work on and different things that came up and we talked about, we used to have the conditional uses that under this would be a perfect circumstance that so many years, you know, that we under a conditional use, we would allow it because it's not permanently changing the zoning. But once you permanently change it and into to um, the different zonings, it, it, we, do, we can't change right. it back. So, so I guess my question is, what is the difference between this and the Lux property where they've been there five years Because they, they, it was, when they did it, they were going to build and stuff. And that one I didn't, it was done before we realized it and stuff. But they have assured me that, in fact, they've got to develop um, a builder now that they are building. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that was to be a short, short period of time. And the, the zoning and planning and zoning approved that. So uh, it, with them approving it, nobody appealed it. So and it was allowed. But it, it's not a permanent thing. So Right. Well, neither but, would this be. I know. But if yeah. it – but we – I guess it's before we got the manufactured overlay. We, yeah. Before we could, we did these things, but then the manufactured overlay comes into effect to where you're basically, you know, changing part of that zoning. So, yeah. so you'd we, have to change it the one acre to be able to do that. So, so we have a motion by Ms. Casbon. Do we have a second? Councilman uh, Taladano, uh, please vote. The motion is unanimous with one absent. Do we need to do a resolution? And uh, uh, Ms. Hasmond, would like to introduce a resolution with that? And Councilman Taladano, you second that? Yeah. Okay. So we have a motion to second. All right. Huh? Oh, we have to vote on that one? We just, I send it just for introduction. No, we got to vote? Okay, we have to vote on that one. It's a resolution. Sorry. Mr. Dean, yes. Mr. Casabon, Mr. Lorino, Mr. Mike Smith, and Mr. Bender. The motion is unanimous with no one absent. All right. We're Moving on to ordinance for adoption. We have ordinance calendar number 7160, ordinance to amend the 2020 grants budget, amendment number 12. Um, Bender Cooper, this was introduced 12 1 2022. Um, Leslie, do you want to briefly? Is my mic on? Okay. So 7160 is for three grant awards received. One for thirty thousand dollars from the Division of the Arts. One for one thousand dollars from Bissell Pet Foundation for Animal Services, and then a four point seven million dollar grant from um, NRCS Natural Resources Conservation Service under the USDA for waterway debris removal in twelve waterways. Thank you. Do I have a, a motion to adopt? Motion by Mr. Candlelight, second by Ms. Casabon. Or sorry, Mr. Brian. <laughs> 
Please vote. You get carried away. <laughs> the motion is unanimous with three absent. Uh, ordinance count, uh, finance order number two, ordinance calendar number 7161, ordinance to amend the 2020 capital improvement budget and capital assets. Amendment number 79, drainage parish wide. Bender Cooper introduced a 12 1 uh, 2022. Sloan? Uh, yes, sir. This um, amendment is for the same project, waterway debris removal. The total project is $5.9 million, of which 90% is funded by NRCS, which was the grant we just uh, budgeted. And then the next item, ordinance calendar 7162, is to fund the 10% uh, match and 15% contingency for this same project um, from the drainage tax. And looking at that note, that's for Bayou Castine, Bayou Chinchuba, Bayou Desire, Bayou Paquet, Bayou Tetlores, Tet yeah. Fox Branch, East, East Bidico, Horse Branch, La Tice Branch, Mile Branch, Savannah Branch, Soap Creek, Tallow Creek, and the Chifuncta River. All right, thank you. Um, Councilman Ryan. I was going to say, I know people in my Hold on. Hold on. Especially those near Bayou Chinchuba. So, so moved. So moved. Second by uh, Mr. Yes, Smith. Uh, please vote. Hmm? Mr. Lachlan. That was a big speech. That was two sentences. <laughs> the motion is unanimous with four absent. Okay. Uh, number three, ordinance counter number 7162, ordinance to amend the 2020 operating budget. Member number 14, Bender Cooper, introduced 12 1 uh, 2022. I believe we. Just had the explanation for that. Um, a motion by Mr. Dean, second by Mr. Marino. Please vote. The motion is unanimous with three absent. All right. Number uh, development ordinance number four, ordinance calendar number 7163, ordinance amending the official zoning map to reclassify 1.577 acres of the land for present A2 suburban district to HC2, highway commercial district ward number one, district number four, 2022, 3005 ZC, Bender Cooper introduced 12 1 2020, ordinance amending the official zoning map of St. Tanny Parish, LA to qualify. I don't have to read that part. Good. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Councilman Lorino. <laughs> You didn't, okay, so move seconded. Uh, all in favor, please vote. The motion is unanimous with three absent. Uh, ordinance calendar number 7164, an ordinance amending the official zoning map to reclassify 5.5 acres of land from its present A1 suburban district to H3 highway commercial district, Ward 8, District 13, 2022, 3046, ZC Bender Cooper introduced 12-1-2022. Uh, this is actually in my district, and this is a fairly significant zoning upgrade. Um, unfortunately, I haven't been able to actually put my eyes on the property because the bridges that access this property on Highway 90 have been closed. So I have to go all the way around the Mississippi, and I, I really need to look at this. I haven't been able to do it, so I would ask that somebody move to postpone this. Um, uh, uh, motion by uh, Mr. Canulet, second by um, Mr. O'Brien. Please vote. The motion is unanimous with two absent. All right. Uh, number six, ordinance calendar 7165, an ordinance amending the official zoning map to reclassify 0.516 acres of land from its present A1 suburban district to A1 suburban district and R rural overlay, Ward 1, District 3. So, so, all right. All right. <laughs> Moved by Mr. Dean, seconded by Ms. Lorino. Uh, please vote. Mr. Taladano. The motion is unanimous with two absent. All right, um, public works ordinance number seven, ordinance calendar 7166, ordinance establishing a no parking here to corner sign on Bayberry Drive, uh, RO4A033, install 30 foot before stop sign, Ward 4, District 4, introduce 12 1 2022. Uh, Councilman Lorino. And seconded by uh, Councilman Canulet. Please vote. Mr. Fitzgerald. 
The motion is unanimous with three absent. Uh, number eight, ordinance calendar 7176, or, sorry, 7167, ordinance accepting finalized <coughs> subdivision in road and drainage inventory, specifically Watson Glen, phase 2A, Ward 1, District 1. Mr. Dean? Uh, so, sorry, Weston Glen. So moved by Mr. Dean, seconded by Mr. Laughlin. Uh, all in favor, please vote. The motion is unanimous with three absent. Uh, Number nine, ordinance calendar number 7168, ordinance establishing a no through truck zone on Simulusa Drive, R020007, Ward 2, District 6. And that is Mr. West Tanner. <laughs> <laughs> See, you lost it. No, I lost you. I, uh, I make the motion and it's Simulusi. Simulusi. And second by Councilman O'Brien. All in favor? The motion is unanimous with three absent. All right. Uh, ordinance calendar number 7169, ordinance to amend the 2022 capital improvement budget and capital assets, amendment number 80, sales act district 3, district 11. Um, this is in my district. This is from my predecessor, so I'm asking if we could um, motion to postpone this to the next okay. meeting. Motion to postpone, second by Ms. O'Brien. Please vote. Uh, well, I'm aware that there are change orders for one of these projects at Royal Drive, 18th drainage. So, I'm if you well, I, yeah. Do you want to have Miss uh, Long talk about it first, or do you want to? Yeah, that's fine with me. Okay. okay. So um, these were proposed by the uh, Department of Public Works for existing projects. The one on Royal 18th Drive drainage. Uh, the funding is to fund a change order, as described in the back, with regard to installing drainage pipe, catch basins, driveway apens, and um, putting sod there as well. So, and it's to increase it from 40,000 to $57,000. And then the other project in this district is Claiborne Drive. It was budgeted for $66,000. And there was an amendment previous to this for 16,008. But I think the quantities, once they were trued up, they need another $2,200 to to have completed the work, so. <laughs> Proceed. All right, uh, motion to adopt by Councilman Laughlin, seconded by Councilman O'Brien. Thank you. Uh, please vote. Thank you, Leslie. The motion is unanimous with two absent. Uh, ordinance calendar, uh, this is number 11, ordinance calendar 7170, ordinance to amend the 2022 capital improvement budget and capital assets amendment number 81, sales stack district three, parish wide roads and drainage. Um, Mike Smith, uh, President Cooper, introduced 12-1-2022. Uh, uh, Leslie? Yes, sir. The project for the amendment here is for the Old River Road Bridge. It is to increase the project by $500,000 to $1,038,000. And I, and I assume, uh, Councilman Smith, you're definitely ready to go forward with that. Mm. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and, and second by Councilman Davis. Please vote. The motion is unanimous with two absent. Uh, or, uh, number 12, ordinance calendar 7171, ordinance to amend the 2023 operating budget. Amendment number one, Tanner Cooper introduced 12-8-2022. Uh, Leslie? Um, this amendment is to the operating budget, and as described in the administrative comment, it's to fund a increase in the cost of living adjustment from 3% to 5%. So it's a 2% change. The total 2% um, additional COLA is $367,398, and it affects most of the funds within the budget. Uh, motion by Councilwoman Tanner. Second by Councilman Canulet. Please vote. Mr. Taladano. The motion is unanimous with three absent. I, uh, we have uh, off the floor item number one. This is a resolution to appoint to fill the vacant seat of Parish Councilman District 14. Um, as we all know, 
Um, this is an urgent matter because we only have 15 days in which to be able to make this appointment. So I'd ask for, for individual vote on this single off the floor item. Did we have a motion for that? open up the floor for nomination. Uh, Councilwoman Tanner moves. Uh, Councilman Laughlin seconds. Uh, please vote. This needs to be unanimous. Mr. Dean, Mr. Fitzgerald, Mr. Labrino, Mr. Taladano. The motion is unanimous with two F's. Uh, we have uh, received two um, applications and also interviewed both those ap applicants. Um, I, I would have a motion to nominate um, Mr. Randolph for the position. Yep. So moved. moved by Councilman Davis. Second, second by uh, Councilman um, Canulet. And, and then we also have Mr. Strickland. Um, is there a motion to nominate him for the position? So moved by Councilman Canulet. Second by Councilman uh, Laughlin. So we have uh, two candidates that have uh, that are up for this. Um, f would uh, Mr. Randolph, would you like to come and, and address the council for three minutes? I applaud you for, for staying the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they both stayed. But I was going to say the same thing about Mr. Strickland too. <laughs> good evening. Good evening. Um, as you well know, my name is Ronald Randolph. I am uh, I'm honored, I'm humbled, and actually I'm elated to stand before you in consideration to follow, to follow in the actual traditions of this parish as it relates to, to making sure that we follow what the parish is really known to have, that is safety, health, and welfare for the entire citizens. And that involves economic development and also the zoning, land use, and, and all of the other things that come along with it. However, I want you all to know that I've been on the planning and zoning committee for, well, since 2012. And I've learned a lot. I've learned a lot with, with, um, with council persons such as Jimmy Davis and Ms. Uh, Kazabon, and uh, not only them, but so many of you who have really uh, allowed us to be an independent, an independent body to make decisions, to review cases, to have cases come before us before they come to you. So it kind of it really affords internal control and also it allows it allows an opportunity for you all to be more effective in what you do um, I've been involved with the with the with the community for years I'm a native Slidellian um, and I product of the school system I've gone through the education process as well but more than anything I believe that it is more important to love what you do, love people, love to make neighbors real neighbors, even though some may get upset at times. Um, it's making sure that you're doing what's right and what's best for the parish. Um, that's why we're the fourth largest. That's why we're growing like we grow because not just the lifestyle, but also the leadership we have, the representation that we have, and the interest and the dedication commitment we have to make sure that all residents, all businesses, and all development comply with what is necessary for us to maintain a certain lifestyle in St. Tammany. Not just parish, not just parish government, but the entire St. Tammany area. Um, that includes all things that make it happen. And I look forward to working with you guys. I appreciate the opportunity, and I look forward to it. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have any questions? <laughs> any questions? Thank you. Uh, Mr. Strickland, would you like to come forward?
Frank, I thought we would have scared you all off, so <laughs> kudos for, for still being here. <laughs> yes. Good evening. Um, I spoke with most of you all, but I stand before you um, for your consideration as an interim for this position. Uh, my passion for St. Tammany, for Slidell, um, and my leadership skills with business and also in the community and to um, work well with others will um, qualify me to be able to be a good candidate for this position. And I pray that you all make the right decision. Any questions? Because <laughs> I've, 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 I've spoke with all y'all before, so there's not a whole lot else to say. Thank you. Thank you, and I appreciate you both uh, putting your names forward. And this is a tough job, and so um, if everybody would uh, vote on your vote sheet. Well, I don't think I get the vote unless it's a tie. You, you have the tie vote. You can option vote, or can vote as a tiebreaker. I'll just wait then. <coughs> Um, the, the council has voted on Mr. Randolph to succeed uh, Mr. Smith. Um, so well, we'll need a motion to congratulations. Um, we, we need a, uh, a, a motion to appoint uh, by Councilwoman Tanner, and who would like to second that? Mike Smith, um, second that. Um, so we need to vote on that. Voting on the vote, yes. The motion is unanimous with no one absent. Just a, just a quick commentary. Two very well qualified individuals. They were devoted to all the time. But there is a veteran of St. Catherine's for our area. So I know. I speak for everybody to say we appreciate their uh, interest and willing to serve more. Although that might be considered a little bit masochistic at times. You know? yes. yeah. Thank you. Uh, a motion to adjourn. Adjourned by Chandler, second by Councilman Canulet. Adjourned. Adjourned.